Welcome to a broadcast of the recent Lorain County Commissioner's General Meeting. Unless otherwise announced, meetings are held Wednesday morning at 9.30 at the Administration Building, 226 Middle Avenue, 4th Floor, Downtown Elyria. These are public meetings and you are invited to attend. Agendas are posted prior to the meeting at www.lorraincounty.us. Click on Departments to see the Commissioner's page, then click on View Agenda. Good morning, everyone. If you'll please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Normally at this point in the meeting we offer uh, an inspirational word, but the, uh, the county and the community uh, suffered uh, a severe loss um, with the true public servant uh, trooper Kenny Velez um, who passed away from injuries that he sustained in an accident on Thursday and uh, we'd like to uh, begin this meeting by remembering him and and uh, his family keeping everybody in our prayers uh, by having a, uh, a moment here of silent reflection Thank you. Uh, our dog this morning, Commissioner Kalo. Back back. <laughs> hey, hey, come here. Come here. Look at you. Come on. Yeah, look, good dog. Come here. Come on. Yeah, look at you. Okay. okay. Strong. You Strong little guy, huh? Hey, buddy. <laughs> Girl. Wow. Where you want to go? Come on. There you go. Our featured dog this week is a mixed breed, breed female. Uh, she was found in LaGrange. Uh, she's got a great personality. Mm -hmm. Again, she's a mix. Uh, she's available for adoption right now. She's been with us a couple of weeks. Uh, how many dogs do we have now, Nelson? Thirty-seven. We have about Ooh. thirty-seven. Okay, we're full house, guys. Mm. So if she doesn't quite meet your needs. I'm sure there's another dog you can find at our kennel looking for a good home. Got a new dog, didn't you? Oh, I was up at four this morning letting her he's got, out. He's got a new grandchild and a new okay. puppy. Last so. week got a new rescue. Yeah, replaced <laughs> Riley. So, uh, wow. it, okay. uh, it's a standard poodle, founder in Columbiana County. Oh. When he wanted a dog that wouldn't shed, I fought for a lab. I lost. <laughs> yeah. Sur wife, surprised by that? You surprised <laughs> that you lost that? Not in the least. Enough. You didn't get another Yorkie. No, 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 no more Yorkies. No little dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no dog was little? up at. What, Yorkies? Poodles. No, standard poodles. To oh, be about 75, oh, 80 pounds. Oh, that, okay. Yeah, no, I don't like little dogs. No, I don't, it's not that I don't like little dogs. I prefer larger dogs. <laughs> yeah. I just so, can't believe you lost that thoughts. on that decision. Wow. Yeah, I lost on that decision, but the pup was up at four this morning. Really, going really good after a week. Mm. Great pup. Mm. But at four this morning, she really needed to go outside, and then I couldn't go back to sleep, so. Wow. Oh, wow. So you got some work done. Got some work done, exactly. Get Returning emails. <laughs> Get a fish. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Get, a <fish. laughs> Get a goldfish. <laughs> um, if, if it's okay with my colleagues, I think this morning we'll um, probably do our three presentations first before we do board uh, business. Um, Madam Clerk, do you want to read off what our presentations are this morning? We have a Spirit of America's History, The Wall, Ronald Smith and Patricia Sexton, Emmy, Director of Crime Lab for his... Uh, 0.16 mil five-year levy, and then a presentation on I think chip. Okay, okay. So, thank you. Okay. Well, if we could call up first um, Ronald Smith and Patricia Sexton. Thank you for joining us here this morning, and you're going to update us on the Spirit of America's history, the Wall. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Yeah, if you microphone. could just use the podium, yeah. that'd be great. Yep, there you go. Since Perfect. we're recording the whole thing, thank you very much. My name is Ron Smith, and I want to thank Lori and the county commissioners for inviting us here today to speak about our very unique project, the Spirit of America Story Traveling Wall. And 
Before I play a video, I'll just give you our mission of our organization. Spirit of America is a volunteer nonprofit 501c3 organization whose mission is to capture and preserve the spirit and rich history of the American people. We do this by honoring those men and women in uniform service who have and are currently serving, protecting our way of life, both here and abroad. If we could just have you maybe look this okay. way and then the cameras will get you. They'll be able to see in the audience on the monitors. Oh. We will continue these efforts in order to educate and inspire future generations of Americans to learn and understand how important the preservation of our history and the inspiration in hearts and minds is to the American people. And before I talk about our organization a little bit, I'll just play a short video. Our mission is to capture and preserve the spirit, the sacrifices, and rich history of the American people. We want to honor those men and women who support and defend our way of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as well as inspire future generations of Americans to understand how important it is to preserve this concept of freedom that we enjoy every day. I knew that as a young child that I would join the military service and that I would become a United States Marine. I wanted to give back to this country, to serve my country, I wanted to give back all of myself to this country. And being a Marine is one who accepts challenges and adversity, faces them head on, and always knows and says to himself, I will never give up. We created this memorial to tell America's story from 1775 to present day. We want to captivate the hearts and minds of the American people to never forget the sacrifice that they made to protect the rights and freedoms we have today. We need to keep America's sense of patriotism ignited and a continued respect for those who support and defend our freedom and way of life both here and abroad. We need to educate our future generations that we are a country of many people, but as Americans we are one. Being American means flying the flag to know the words to the national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance and bursting with pride when you hear those. It means being thankful for all those who have given their lives for this country. Finally, being an American means appreciating its great beauty. As a volunteer nonprofit organization, we pledge our time, talent, and resources to honor the men and women who support and defend this country. My name is Patricia A. Sexton. I'm the wife of Sergeant David Mason Sexton, the U.S. Army, who lost his life on March 15, 1971, and his remains have yet to come home to his son and I. During the years after I lost my husband, I felt like I needed to be doing something more for this country and our service. I went and got involved with Rolling Thunder, Chapter 5 out of Ohio. We built a POW MIA traveling wall that depicted the 137 names that were still classified as either prisoners of war or missing in action. Then in 2004, Ron Smith joined, and all the years after that we traveled talking to military talking to every you know, family that we possibly could and realized from what they were saying that we needed possibly to have something else that depicted the spirit of the American people and to honor our military men and women, our police and fire. In January 2014, Ray Simon of Ray Simon Art was contracted to paint the artwork. Ray's work always evokes a strong emotional feeling that pays tribute to the individual or event. He masterfully uses his artistic gift and integrates it with his deep love and reverence for American culture. In 2013, it was just a vision, but as of November 2015, it will be a reality. We encourage and challenge everyone to do whatever they can to honor those brave individuals who support, defend, and preserve our way of life. Please help and join us as we bring the spirit of America's story to thousands of Americans who want to pay tribute and honor to those who support and defend our great country. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed nice. that video. That very nice. Mm -hmm. What the video doesn't show is the time, the effort, and the expense that Pat and I have put into this project. We actually started, as the, the video said there, we started this project as a vision in 2013. In 2014, we turned around and took it upon ourselves to travel with some tribute artwork, attending as many events that we could attend. 
and in hopes of seeing what the people would think of the creation of such a wall and what great responses we received like where's the wall going to be is it permanent will it be traveling will it go to schools and the answer was yes to all the above is we want to take it to small town america to large town america and what our pledge is is what we strive to do is to strive and recognize and honor the men and women who serve and protect our country in uniform we will never let, allow ourselves to forget the success of our country as a nation depends on them. We will show our commitment by never underestimating the importance of these brave men and women who have or are serving and the, to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice on behalf of a grateful nation. We encourage and challenge ourselves to move forward and to do whatever we can to help pay America's debt to honor those brave individuals. We strongly believe and support these objectives because there is a special ability a special grace to those who support and defend our way of life for the next generations of Americans. In 2014, as I said, we got such great responses that Pat and I were so passionate about this project because we believe in this country and we believe in our men and women in uniform that we took the entire year of 2015 off to move forward with this project. Spent about three and a half months researching the images another three and a half months putting them together with our other developers and we turned it over to the artist to start painting and the artist actually paints these canvases when the wall is done it's actually 92 inches tall 100 feet long full color traveling we presently have 70 feet of it completed 92 inches by 70 feet long uh, showing our spirit of America story our history from 1775 to present day and just to give you an idea of of the time that we did and how we we actually cut and pasted the images everybody asked how did you come up with all the images we actually did a, a custom painting on the floor of drawing the images out taking pictures in our laptop and then selling them to the developers and I'll take just a brief second to show you exactly what one of the canvases looked like and when you think of the wall think of these as there's nine more panels just like these that we're going to show you Wow. Oh, wow. Unbelievable. These are the size of the canvases, and the artist actually paints these in two foot by 40 inch original canvases. And then we go through another process to put them into high resolution and then to enhance them up onto these canvases, which there'll be 10 of them. This is just Korea, uh, 92 inches, 10 foot wide. Well, and what I wanted to do is is to kind of is to give the people the idea of what Pat and I have put into this project. Um, the artistry for this project to paint for the artistry was was twenty five thousand dollars. The framework for all the canvases and uh, the canvases themselves was another fifty three thousand dollars. Um, we paid uh, one of our developers, Fred Mosey, who actually helped us develop the images and set them into a timeline. That was a cost of about $10,000. Then we have uh, our second developer who helps us put them into high resolution to enhance them into the canvases as you've seen here today. And there's another $5,000 that we've invested. And in 2015, when we got our, received our 501C, we started fundraising for this total cost, which is estimated to be right now at $98,000. Well, Pat and I, being two unknown people, never getting into the fundraising to realize what it was like, really got to find out just how hard it is. And we, did, we thought we did quite well. We raised about $40,000 to this project in 2015. We went ahead and we talked among ourselves, and Pat and I said, let's go ahead with this. So we put about $40,000 of our own money into this project. Mm. So actually what we're trying to do now is to get support, ask people to join us in this unique project because there is a historical opportunity to make a lives and the difference of our men and women in uniform in this country. So we're actually trying to raise a, another $23,000 by the next few months here or by the end of the year to turn around and have this project completed and it is going to be done by the end of the year. We're looking to have the last 30 feet of it done so we'll be showing 100 feet 
So we're trying to raise the, the $23,000 for the project. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll feel free to take your questions. Where do you, where do you plan on doing the first uh, public unveiling? Well, that we've been talking about. We were hoping, we actually I don't want to give away any secrets. I mean, if you don't want to announce it, that's well, fine. We that's actually just have, curious. We actually have an unveiling. We're actually been asked to come to the Rod and Piston Show in the IX Center in March. Hmm. And if everything goes right down, we're going to have it there. Now, the Rod and Piston Show, everybody's going to think, well, what would you be at, at a, basically a car show for? Well, what this organization does, the IX Center does for this event, is they raise money for the Fisher House. And last year at, at the, the event, they raised about $75,000 toward the Fisher House. So we thought that would be a good place for us to take this wall and unveil it and show what we do for our men and women in uniform. And it's not just honoring our, our military men and women, women, but it's honoring our Native, Native Americans, our law enforcement, and our fire and police. So we're, we're looking at probably the IX Center, if nothing happens before that. We have been showing it, actually, when we got the first 40 feet done. We actually had two private events that we went to, but the biggest one was on December 7th when we went to Norwalk St. Paul's Catholic School. Mm. They asked us to bring it in the school. We had 40 feet, as I stated, but what we did was make an extra panel that showed this other six images that would make up the 60 feet of what this wall would look like. And we thought we were only going to have about five minutes with each classroom Well, the school decided they brought two and three classrooms in at a time. We had 40 minutes with each group. And as we said to them, let's take a walk through history. So we have gradually shown it. Like we Ron had said, we are at 70 feet right now. We have a panel for 9-11 to finish, and then two for the war on terror, Iraq and Afghanistan, to finish by the end of the year. Mm. They were actually at the... Um, Veterans Reunion down oh, at yes. Black River Landing. Right. Mm -hmm. The entire, what, what you have so far was on display there and yes. it was very, very nice, very, yeah. Now we're actually scheduled for, uh, we're doing this weekend and we, and, uh, we invite Avon, we invite Lorraine La, uh, Amherst to come to because we're actually gonna have it on display for Sandusky's Oktoberfest mm. in the Sandusky State Theater. Dave Taylor has been instrumental in trying to help us gain exposure, media exposure with this wall because we thought that when we first started this that all we'd have to do was contact the newspapers and they would just jump for this and say, oh yeah, this is a story. Well, we're not a story until they come to, till we come to their town. That's what we were told. And this is a problem that we have with the wall. We're getting good public exposure with it, community exposure. We just are lacking trying to get it out there for a big media exposure. Well, the media's here today and this will be on television twice, so. Uh, hopefully you'll get some additional experience. And one last thing is the way with the wall we designed it and a lot of people said well you know we may want your wall in an event but they said you know how would we put 100 feet into a, a, say a room like this and we said well we put a lot of thought before we started painting this and working on this is that we designed it that it can be displayed in its entirety uh, all 100 feet we can actually separate it we can put it 50 feet back to back in a room and we were tested with uh, uh, another creation that we told people that we could do is that we could separate these panels into smaller panels around a room. Well, we were tested with this. We had it at Canfield Fair for a week. We were at the Mahoning uh, County Veterans Memorial, which was in a log cabin. Mm -hmm. We actually separated this, broke this down. We had uh, two panels outside the, on the front porch, the first and the ending panel. And we put six panels inside that look like portraits around the room. Mm -hmm. It took us, normally it takes us about four hours for three people to set this up. We worked on this for about seven hours getting mm -hmm. it in the cabin because we wanted to make it look like it was a permanent part of the cabin. Mm -hmm. And when people actually come in the next day to see it, they actually said, wow, this is beautiful. When, did, when was this all put in here permanently? Mm -hmm. Well, when we turned around and told them, we said, well, we traveled with this. And again, these were people asking, where's this from where are you from and it just goes to show that we didn't have the media attention again to actually show people and this is what we're hoping to gain is, is some media attention and, and we're looking for sponsors to join us with this project 
What, uh, if people would like more information, is there a specific, I, I see on your literature here, but I don't want to be giving out phone numbers unless you want numbers given out or whatever it may be here. Do you want to? There's fine. Okay. Anything that's on that is, is it able to use it be on the website, mm -hmm. uh, www.spiritofamericastory.com, all lowercase, those spacing. Uh, that right there, actually, there's a drop down box, which actually, if you look at that, you'll be able to see that there's also a link to our Facebook. The Facebook is a lot of the pictures that we have recently taken and the videos. Well, why don't we have help just put Yeah, this we'll up put this information screen. up we'll on the screen. on the screen with all the contact information on it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we want to thank you, uh, Ron, for your service. Patricia, sorry for your loss. And, and, uh, but this is, a, this is a great project. Well, we thank you. Lori, thank you. And commissioners, we thank you for allowing us to speak here today. Thanks for thank coming you. in. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Up next, uh, we're going to have uh, Emmy, and he'll give us uh, information here about the Lorain County Crime and Drug Lab. And uh, you know, coming up in November, we have the uh, the Crime Drug Lab Corner Levity Levy, uh, which will be going before voters. Uh, that's issue number thirty-three. And uh, thank you for being here this morning to to update us on what is going on with the uh, the Crime Lab. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning Thank you for inviting me to uh, uh, be with you this morning and uh, uh, discuss what we do in the laboratory in support in passing the, 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 the crime lab and the coroner's uh, office levy. Um, and I will tell you some stories that will, that will hopefully help the residents and the voters make th this, this decision to keep the laboratory going. Oh. We are all aware that heroin kills. We read it in the newspaper. We watch it on the television. We see that these drugs killed a lot of people. But we don't hear the sufferings the family had had experienced. We don't read the sufferings, the tragedies in the television and also in the newspaper. <coughs> but I will tell you one story that affect my life and some of, of my family. A 17-year-old male who tried to better himself, worked during the day and goes to school and went to school in the evening. Walking home from school at 10 o'clock in the evening, a stranger approached him from behind, put a knife on his neck, and was killed that night. They found out later on that the person who did this was a drug trafficker or a drug-seeking person. I know the story well because he was my nephew. The mother of this child, six months later, passed away from broken heart. Twelve months later, his father passed away from broken heart, the only son. This is just one story that affects our lives. They made the decision, but families and us will not give up for them. We don't give up. Center for Disease Control and Prevention reported the staggering death with 248 increase involving heroin from 2010 to 2014. In Lorain County, we are at the epicenter of epidemic, heroin epidemic. 31 heroin overdose deaths were reported from October 2013 to September of 2014. I'm sure that that number had reached a phenomenal number from, uh, uh, up to this date. These heroin overdose deaths, though, do not represent overdose deaths tied to fentanyl. <coughs> fentanyl started showing up in Lorain County 
at the end of 2013 and spread into Cuyahoga and Summit counties in 2015. We know we processed all of those controlled substances submitted to us by law enforcement agencies. It was alarming then, but we soon found out a year and two years later, the vast number of those heroines out there on, uh, on the street. We need to pass this levy this coming November for the crime rate levy and the coroner's office due to reasons that I am going to present and why we need the laboratory. Also to mention the top 10 states by total fentanyl seizure in 2014, you will see that Ohio is the top states, even higher than Massachusetts and most major cities at 1,245. The reasons why we need this criminal levy is because of the rising costs. The increased volumes of drugs being submitted to the laboratory for analysis, the more tests we perform, the more materials we need to run these tests. If you look at the number of submissions from law enforcement agencies, the month of August of 2016, you will look, you will see that from 2015 to 2016, there's almost 44% increase of those controlled substances submitted to us and analyzed. These are just substances submitted and analyzed by us. I just can't imagine how many more drugs out there that hasn't been confiscated or seized and submitted to the laboratory. Can you tell us the difference between Series 1 and Series 2, what those mean? Uh, those uh, uh, Series 1 and Series 2 is basically the, 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 the number of years from 2008 to 2016. And also the Series 2 are the numbers of controlled substances submitted to us and analyzed. It's the same number that you have from 2008 of 574 seized drugs to 2016 of 1,328. It just shows the, the, the graph uh, uh, of, uh, of the level of uh, uh, number of seizures. So, so the, more, the more drugs submitted to us, it will increase our costs. Uh, number two, heroin and fentanyl and illicit opiates being brought in on a daily basis by submitting agencies. Syn synthetic drugs that's never before seen in Lorraine County. We have seen so many synthetic drugs since 2013, 14, and also this year. Uh, you probably have heard the, the, the uh, drugs such as U47700, the three methyl fentanyl, the so long of those names that actually affected uh, all the lives of our citizens. U47700 was first analyzed and identified here in Lorraine County by our laboratory. When I contacted Lake County Crime Lab and also Cuyahoga County Crime Lab, I asked them if they have seen U47700 in their county. They said no. A week later, the chief toxicologist of Lake County Regional Crime Lab informed me that they have the first fatal overdose on this U47700. Because of that analysis that we have started and pursued, I believe a month later, Governor Kasich uh, placed the U47700 as Schedule One because of the fatal overdose, not only, not only uh, and Lake County, but also from other counties. The scariest thing about synthetic drugs is everything that's unknown. You never know what you're going to get, especially when you order them online. Anything, and I will ask any, anybody, just type in any drugs and try to search it in Google. You can buy anything on the internet. 
A good example of that is Logan, was Logan Steiner. He didn't know what he's going to get. He knew caffeine is a supplement, but there's no direction or instructions on how much you have to take. When he died of this, from, from this caffeine, that caffeine powder was, was taken from his possession and submitted to our laboratory. The parents would like to know what killed their son. That's when the crime lab comes in. It was taken by Deputy Coroner Dr. Miller. It was dropped off at 9 o'clock in the morning. We ran that sample. In an hour and a half, we knew what killed their son. The standard for each single group of drugs, such as heroin, fentanyl, cocaine, uh, must be purchased by the county crime lab in order to confirm test results. We cannot result out our, our testing without buying those standards. Legally, we have to. The cost of each standard, one single drug of standard, cost us from $18 to $165 per one mil or one milligram. How long do we use it up? It depends on how many drugs of the same uh, uh, group that comes in or submitted. In addition to that, we have to pay $35 for shipping charges for every controlled substances we order from these companies. We are obligated to pay for those shipping charges because they are all controlled substances. So because of that, the laboratory must have a license to make sure that we are legally, can legally uh, uh, process the controlled substances, um, licenses that we get from Ohio State Board of Pharmacy, including the Drug Enforcement Administration or the DEA. Number four, with rising volume controlled substances being submitted, more, more testing supplies are needed. We need the standards, we need the reagents, we need the instrument parts. In addition to that, the cost for the renewal of service contracts to maintain our instruments. Proficiency testing program, which is a must to show the credibility of the laboratory. Uh, license fees, affiliation fees, they are all increasing every year up to 12 percent. Why do we need the county crime lab? Why do we want the residents understand that what we do is vital in pursuing the people who, who, who did all, all, all of these crimes. Laboratory test result is very important because the law enforcement agencies, the prosecutor's office, and the judges cannot prosecute without the test results. And so therefore, we have to work hard to make sure that those test results are done in an acceptable uh, 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 manner. The fatal overdoses are analyzed and processed immediately per our laboratory policy. That is the policy that I have started that, that no other laboratory offers. There's no need to wait weeks or months for test results relating to deaths. We automatically analyze drugs submitted to us related to fatal overdoses, and secondly, overdoses, especially those new designer drugs. We do that automatically. So if there's no lab results, no cr criminal proceedings. It is very vital that we keep up with the demands. Rapid turnaround time for overdose-related cases, as well as other drugs routinely submitted. As, as, as I have given the example of, uh, 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 of the caffeine identity identification, 
it took us one hour and a half to get, to get the results. It is really very important for us, for the parents, for the enforcement agencies, and also for the criminal justice system. Legal blood or urine alcohol and or urine drug tests are processed within 24 hours or will be tested on the same day if submitted on the early part of the day. OVIs, anything, DUIs, blood sample or urine sample submitted to us for alcohol are done within an hour. On the same day it was submitted. In the past, law enforcement agencies sent them to the state crime lab. It usually takes them four to six weeks before they get one single blood alcohol results. Not in this county, not in this laboratory. You'll get it in an hour. Once they are submitted, it is done that day. The urine drug tests are processed within 24 hours or upon request by the judge or the magistrate. Because we service different county agencies, uh, divorce cases, uh, 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 family drug court, juvenile drug court, probation, uh, both for the county court and also for the municipal court. We service over the Muni, uh, Elyria, Lorraine, and Abu Naik Muni. The judges send their clients to us for testing. And the results are done within 24 hours. Uh, I mean, can I stop you for a second? I just spoke to a woman a couple weeks ago about sweat patches. Have yes. you heard of those? Or we don't use them. Yes, um, sweat patch is uh, is fine, but there are also a disadvantages on a sweat patch. We don't do it in the laboratory. Is it One, cost? It's not. It costs cost, a lot of money. It costs a lot of money. That's what I thought. Uh, uh, in every sample that are, are that drug tests are done. There are advantages and disadvantages, as we all know it. One of the uh, disadvantages of the sweat, pa uh, sweat patch is that they have to keep it in their arms up to 72 hours. And so the problem is that some of them are intentionally taken off or accidentally taken off when they take showers. And so there's, there's a lot of issues there. Not only that, not only because it's, it's too expensive, it also takes a long time to get the results. And, and many of, of, of the uh, uh, agencies who require immediate results, it's not ideal. Okay. It's not ideal. Uh, the laboratory, our laboratory, is the only laboratory in Lorraine County that has a legal alcohol permit through the Ohio Department of Health. So therefore, all of the legal blood alcohols and reunion alcohols comes to us. And because we do all of these tests, we also have to prepare to testify in court, making sure that all of these tests are scientifically based. Hospital laboratories no longer accept this. So therefore, all 14 agencies, law enforcement agencies in Grand County submit them to us. Officers have access to our laboratory, which is centrally located, so there's no need to travel outside the county. This saves time and money to submitting agencies. In the past, the evidence officer has to take the tube of blood or the urine sample or controlled substances to either BCI in Richfield or to Columbus. That pulls the evidence officer and the police officer from their ward. They had to travel two hours just to take those specimens. Now, what they've done, they compromised. You can mail those urine samples and blood to us. The result is still the same. It will still take them four, even to six weeks before they get the results. So, Drug doesn't care who you are, whether you're an innocent victim of heroin-related crime or a user. We are asking the public and the residents and the voters to support the, 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 the levy 
and uh, and I know commissioners and Mr. Cordes uh, certainly continue to support the laboratory. Uh, we might not realize how important what we do in the laboratory until something happens to you or to us. And I hope that the public sees the importance of this laboratory. And uh, uh, thank you again for inviting me if you have any questions. Uh. I would hope the FOP and the other uh, <coughs> law enforcement agencies would step up and do some type of resolution saying that they're going to support this levy and I mean actually get out there and you know do some letters to the editor and editorial boards or whatever it takes to, to get this levy passed. We're, we're working on that commissioner we have <coughs> we have a plan we're a little bit behind but uh, because we don't have the ability to spend our dollars our levy is not one of those special levies that allows us to spend money to support the levy uh, we're going to do the grassroots do the uh, EMT providers <laughs> Uh, uh, the law enforcement providers to try to uh, generally have those frontline first defense people um, uh, tell a story about why they need the lab. Uh, as a point of reference, the lab is moved from the court, the old courthouse, into the basement of the county administrative building. Excuse me, the lower level suites. Uh, sorry about that, Emmy. Uh, the the. Uh, and it really isn't a basement. It, it is, has been used for administrative spaces as before. And we've just revived the old purchasing area that we have uh, uh, on the east side of the uh, bottom of the building. Uh, I hope that uh, within the next two years to two and a half years, we have a permanent home for the lab. It's really uh, not as best for the community to be in this building as it is to be in a structure that has more curbside use, more road appeal. Uh, easier uh, access but as you know we're renovating the courthouse and we had to make some quick moves so we decided upon that as a temporary solution uh, I would suspect that after we have done with the adult probation we'll have some movement with 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 the lab and I briefly told you some ideas and we have time on that also we've had this levy on before we didn't have a unanimous <coughs> board before mm -hmm. with regard to these issues the situation since the last time we've gone to the taxpayer has become more dire. There's been more deaths uh, from overdoses. Uh, there is more need for services than ever since the last time we asked the taxpayers uh, uh, to support this. It's not a huge levy. Uh, about three, of, about four hundred thousand dollars of this combined levy will. Uh, could be used for lab services. The split hasn't been exactly allocated yet. It's very similar to what we did with the drug task force a couple of years ago, which was was very necessary. Uh, and for the commissioners, the the coroner will be in soon to talk about his issues, which is the other half of this combined levy for services. Uh, and he works in conjunction with with Emmy all the time. I can't speak to the good work that's being done mm -hmm. over there, but we have to have resources to do this right now we're operating on a levy I think that brings in about a hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year hundred seventy thousand dollars a year it's not a lot of money uh, to be trying to run a, a certified lab and be able to provide services uh, to the community well it's five dollars and sixty cents a year on a hundred thousand dollar for both right Correct. For, for both. both. So it's two, if we did Whatever is 50 50 split, if you're we, three bucks and three bucks or 280 and 280. Okay. No less than a happy meal uh, to provide a needed service, as Emmy showed. It's 44% increase. And I speak to a lot of law enforcement around the county. They have nothing but kudos to say about the crime lab, maybe, and what you do and what Steve Evans does as county coroner and his deputy coroners. And it's just something we really need to deal with. And like I said, less than six bucks, we would hope the public would step up to support an issue like this. And let's say that's for both the coroner and, and the, the crime drug. lab. So Correct. it's not that's just for both. the crime, for the for the drug and crime lab. Uh, we need we need greater services for our for our uh, uh, safety forces in Lorain County. They need more rapid turnaround. There's things that we should be doing at the lab that we're not because of cost. Um, and I'm hoping that if we get the support of the community, we can provide those those services here. There's still a lot of work that goes down to BCI because we're unable to do it here. That's correct. That's correct. And Talks and we would we would like to be able to, to shorten that turnaround mm -hmm. time and the portal to portal time it takes to because you have to have chain of custody of those things. Uh, and 
uh, we're not looking to compete, we're looking to enhance mm -hmm. and, and be able to uh, overall effectively lower the cost to the community by doing it here rather than doing it out of Richmond where the BC Well, by the time right you now. take a police officer and his costs and the transportation to take a two-hour ride or an hour and a half to Richfield or Columbus, turn it in, turnaround time, and make it back. I mean, you've blown five or six hours of a work day. And, and, and that's not to say that there's, there's work that the BCI in Richfield does that we will never do. Correct. And they have been good partners. And, and actually, they were supportive of our last mm -hmm. levy drive okay. for the things that we did here because we're not in competition with them. They don't need to be doing the things that we're doing here because it just slows their lab down mm -hmm. too. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think that uh, uh, a, a bifurcated approach to how these services are done in conjunction with the services provided by the state is, is extremely necessary in this community for efficiencies and, and to be able to get rapid turnaround. Fine job, Emmy, as I always. I have a Thank question. Um, in your opinion, I've, or you probably know this, the, the fentanyl and the car fentanyl that's getting cut in with the heroin, is that happening before it gets here or after it gets here? Are the, is my question. Do you know that? Uh, I think so he would have to be a drug dealer to know that. No, but I mean, <laughs> is it coming in that way? Well, it's coming in from, uh, we, we, we don't know what, what it's coming in, but uh, the, the, the whole point about the crime lab is, is, is to provide and, and, and identify those drugs that's coming in or designer drugs. And, and uh, I have to make the decision whether to buy, purchase the, the standards because we can't report it out as a controlled substance unless we have the standard. But uh, uh, this is where the communication with the BCI uh, and other uh, the, uh, uh, regional crime lab, we, we all talk, including the DEA laboratory division in, in, in Washington. Uh, I'm in communication with them every week. In fact, I just talked to them about something else that we are working on right now before it goes, uh, 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 uses, start using them. Uh, we really have, I really have to uh, do a lot of research before uh, um, this new design that comes in again in Lorraine County. So far, the carfentanil, we have not seen here in Lorraine County. Uh, uh, Cuyahoga County had seen it and also Summit County. And the question, it's probably, the, the question will be to the drug task force, uh, uh, why aren't we getting it in Lorraine County? Well, my opinion, we don't want it. Uh, but why? Why not Lorraine County? But other drugs came in to, to Lorraine County before Lake County and Cuyahoga County had seen the U47700 and also the three uh, methylphenol. Mm -hmm. They also killed uh, a lot of people. Uh, the coroner's office can even tell you the specific reasons why those people are died because of the toxicology uh, uh, analysis. And those are the things maybe perhaps in the future, uh, just to add uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, reason. If we can offer toxicology in our crime lab, including even a part-time position for a fingerprint examiner, I, I, I we can do a, a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, 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 advantages for law enforcement communities uh, and also the county residents. Uh, the coroner's office doesn't have to send their toxicological body fluid to Pennsylvania. If we have toxicology, we can do that for them, and that will eliminate uh, uh, the the the, uh, the the time uh, that test, uh, are tested. You don't have to wait six months, eight months before you get the results. Uh, so uh, I think the, the, this levy with and sharing it with the coroner's office is really a, a, a win-win for us. Uh, working with them directly, I enjoy working with them. Uh, we can solve some mysteries or questionable uh, deaths uh, because of the controlled substances submitted to us by law enforcement agencies and correlated with their toxic toxicological uh, uh, test results. Uh, uh, it's amazing when those two departments combine their, their, their knowledge, uh, uh, the process is easier, much easier for everyone. Yeah, I just want to thank you for, for all that you do. I mean, you do amazing work. The crime lab does amazing work. It's really, really sad uh, and unfortunate that we weren't able to pass this last time around. Uh, you do have the full support of the board this initiative has the full support and 
this is what happens with obstructionist behavior um, where situations get worse and things don't get addressed. Obviously the heroin issue has gone through the through the roof and uh, the number one concern of any any parent, any individual is the safety of their family and their children and, and um, no one wants a family member to be a victim as you know has touched your family and a lot of crime that's happening in this county is you know you can't even go through a, a drive through to Taco Bell without getting shot uh, you know it's it's really sad and unfortunate all the the crime that's taking place and you know I know it's popular for a lot of people to say no to government and no taxes but uh, this drug issue isn't going away and we need to be able to turn around information quickly for the drug enforcement people we need to turn it around quickly for the families so they understand what's going on with their loved ones and so that the prosecutors in the corner and everybody has all the information they need so they can you know prosecute these individuals get them off the streets get them behind bars get them away from our neighborhoods get them away from our kids and our families and uh, this is very important uh, for us to be able to do and I, I just want to thank you personally for the practice that you have put in place of quickly turning around this information it's it's frustrating when people are working on these drug cases and they have to wait forever to get the information back from the lab and um, so you're making a big difference and you're helping this county tremendously but you know we can't do it on our own this is where the community support needs to come in and um, I've yet to talk to anybody who's not concerned about the the heroin issue in the county and so I would certainly hope that the community support will be there and for the little bit that we're asking for this about five dollars sixty cents a year and a hundred thousand dollar property um, that's that's not much of an investment uh, to have to make to, to provide for safety for your family but uh, you run a good operation over there and and we just appreciate all that you're doing. Thank you. And I will share the pieces to my staff. Uh, but by the way, we like the new location. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what was that? He likes the new location. <laughs> and thank you for, for all the help, uh, especially Karen Davis. Uh, it made uh, this, this relocation and move much easier. We move everything in one day. Nice. In one day. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Our next presentation, uh, Don Romantic, Community Development. You have an update for us this morning? What don't you work on in this county, Don? Uh, <laughs> something that's not a science. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> uh, thank you, board. Um, today we're going to be talking about our housing programs in general but probably most specifically our, our chip program it's a two-year grant that we receive from the state It is probably the single busiest program that uh, community development operates it generates a lot of legislation you're used to seeing the home repairs and the POR legislation that comes down all the time on a regular basis and this is a program that allows us to really keep people into the, in their homes uh, protects our uh, neighborhoods, the housing values, and actually produces a lot of economic activity because every one of those pieces of legislation is pretty much a contract going to uh, local people to buy the materials and provide the labor to keep people in their homes and protect our tax base and create that economic activity. So with that today, uh, I'm going to have uh, Linda Blanchett, who administers the program day to day, Megan Wainwright, a uh, relatively new economic development specialist who works on it, and she'll cover the NSP program. And Drake Hopewell is here as well, and he and I will kind of stand back and uh, be available for support. Uh, Drake works with the homeowners themselves directly, a little bit with the contractors, and then also uh, works on special projects as they come up, uh, particularly in the housing, but also on some small business issues as well. So we're not just housing up here as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Linda, and she can begin to take us through the presentation. I normally stand over there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, those were two very emotional presentations. I hope this one is a little more uplifting with uh, how we've spent the money in the county. Every year we apply for the CHIP grants. It's a very competitive grant. We're going to tell you today how this money has been spent in the past CHIP grant. Uh, the home, nope. 
This is why I brought Don. The uh, home repair uh, program is part of the CHIP grant. There's basically three elements to it. The home repair is to assist those homeowners that lack the resources to address a housing program that possesses an immediate threat. Uh, these are more minor issues, maybe a furnace, a roof, a septic system, which is not really minor, but in the grand scheme of this grant, uh, they're smaller projects. Uh, the minimal lim limit of uh, assistance is $250. I'm here to tell you we never do anything for $250. Um, maximum level is $8,000. We can replace a septic system for eight, up to uh, $15,000. Um, these levels are being raised by the state. Next year's grant will have a little bit higher caps on our, our uh, levels. The, thank you. The private owner rehab portion of the grant is to correct the basic building code issues. These are more issues than just one or two items in the home repair program. The level of, of assistance, the minimal is $1,000. Again, we can't go into a home and look for code issues and do $1,000 of work. Normally we walk in and we see many code violations that have to be assisted. The maximum level of assistance is 35000 That's without lead. If, if we do find lead, we can go up to only 46000 um, Sounds like a lot of money, but to mediate the, the lead, to abate the lead, it, it, it is expensive. So if we do walk into a home and they need $40,000 worth of work, but yet they have lead or they have $30,000 worth of, lead, uh, of repairs and they need lead removed, we have to walk away from the project because of the restrictions that, the, that HUD puts on the programs. The other component is the rental housing assistance. In this program, we can pay for security deposits, uh, first month's rent, and first month's utilities. The Lorraine Metropolitan Housing Association uh, Authority is essential to Lorraine County in this program. We have a contract with them, whereas they provide the clients, they provide um, all of the paperwork, the background checks. Uh, we, we are basically the uh, port for the money on this. Um, we assisted 35 people through that program last, this last grant. The number of households that have been served in the CHIP 14 grant uh, with CDBG dollars in the home repair, we have assisted 21 people in Lorain County, Oberlin and Sheffield Lake. And remember again, Oberlin and Sheffield Lake are partners in this program with Lorain County. Um, in the Ohio, using Ohio Housing Fu Trust Fund dollars, we have assisted 14 people in Lorain County, Oberlin, and Sheffield. The private owner rehab program, this uses home dollars. We have assisted 18 people in Lorain County, Oberlin, and Sheffield Lake. And in the uh, rental housing assistance program, that is also home dollars. We assisted <coughs> 35 people in Lorain County. So far, uh, we have invested $937,922 in, in Lorain County through these programs. You can see that the uh, CDBG budget for the home building repair was $245,000 to date, and we only have until October 31st to spend all of this money, so we're, we're working hard up there. We've spent $189,172. Uh, using Ohio trust funds in the home building repair activity, our uh, our budget was 100,000. We have spent 81,852. These numbers move all through the grant. Sometimes we walk into someone's home and the inspector goes to inspect, and he's looking at a home repair. The client says, "I I just need a roof," and he walks in and says, "Whoa." you need a furnace and a roof and you need this repaired and you need that repaired. 
So what we thought was going to be home repair dollars, we have now moved to the private owner rehab. So these numbers move all the time. Linda, can I, can I, I want to do a little interacting with, sometimes the public doesn't understand that. So if somebody doesn't understand the program, they're going to go, oh, so they went there for a roof and you decided to give them a whole bunch more. Uh, you know, that, so we explain that we really can't rehab a house we put a roof on a deficient house that we have certain requirements under the program uh, to secure the premises properly. Even if the homeowner only wants a roof, it doesn't really work that way. Could you do a little information on that for us? We, we can do just a roof if that's all they want because that is part of the home repair. But yeah, we never walk in looking for things but, but you have code. You have the codes that you. Don's shaking his head. Yes, behind you. Yes, we have the building codes that we must adhere to. Right. So we have to bring the property up. Up to code. Up yes. to code, so that we can we can we can use these funds on the building. Is correct. 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 Okay. But and yes. <laughs> okay. It gets very complicated. It, it does yes. get complicated, but the public doesn't get a chance to hear about this much. Right. And, you know, it, it just sounded, and I know you didn't mean it that way, and that's why I'm trying to interact with you a little bit. It just sounded like we upsized it because they happened to be there and saw, well, you need this, you need that. And I, I want them to understand that, that there are certain requirements under the, some of this programming that, that all the uh, deficiencies be remedied uh, because you have to have the house has to be in a code safe condition when you're done correct correct what we For have instance, done if you had a, f a faulty foundation the house is fault you wouldn't put a, a roof on a, a house that's falling down so you right. want to make sure the house is adequate and up to code before you right and there have been some instances where they've gone in to do some initial work and the, the home was deemed basically not salvageable it's a walk away because there's so much expenditure that has to be done on the home that it's not practical and it won't fit within the scope of the funds that are available to work on the home, even though they may have only wanted certain things done on the home. It's important for the public to understand that, that, that these requirements are not developed locally. They're, they're what's placed on the burden of the grant. They could have asbestos that they didn't even know they had, things that would need to be abated, all, all types right. of things. Right? What, what we have done in the past, the state has given us new guidelines on when we must meet certain goals those have moved our program at a fast track. Um, so if you see us all, if you hear a lot of movement upstairs, it's us, us running back and forth <laughs> because we have to meet these goals. 25% of the grant has to be committed, which means contracts signed by March of next year for the next grant. That's a lot to, to get accomplished. But what we have done in the past is we, we normally started with the home repairs because they were usually something serious. <coughs> We start our grant in, it's supposed to start in September. Roofs start leaking. We get thaws. We get a lot of calls about roofs. So we always started the home repairs first. And that's where we would say to the people, you should apply for the, for the uh, POR portion of this because the, the inspector has seen some other things. Now we are starting with <coughs> the uh, PORs first because of our strict deadlines. So we won't be moving as much in these programs with dollars. With, with, with the other thing you have there, it says CHIP 2014, we're in 16. Do you want to explain why it says 2014 there? That's our program year. Program years are different than our fiscal years, and our grants run for two years. And so for, just for what the public may be looking at, this is our current program. Correct. <laughs> We're Correct. not giving them old data. Yes. It's, uh, it's no, our current this is, programming. This and, is what's happening now. And we'll be applying for a new program. We have applied for a oh, new we program. Have, we did receive the grant. We just received notice. Um, there is a, a uh, press release coming down. Um, I believe Don has it now and needs to forward it. Um, we are announcing October the 5th we will have a kickoff meeting for this chip, new CHIP program. So we will have folks come in to meeting room B. Yes? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Don. <laughs> yes, it is, Don. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of one of the roofs wow. that uh, we were up against. As you can see, until the contractor pulls off 
the, she the, the shingles, the sheeting, does he see what he's up against? You know, Commissioner, one of the, one of the uh, biggest areas, we, we always put contingency funds into these jobs. Don and I monitor the performance of these contracts, especially the use of contingency funds. That's usually an area that can be greatly abused. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that 90% of our use of contingency funds is for, for rotted decking. That, that even if they are up on the roof, they can sense that there's some decking problems, but until you uh, remove the entire roof, uh, the extent of the damage is not fully comprehended. And uh, that, that's why we have contingency funds in these bids. Anytime you've ever had a roof replaced on your own home, they will tell you, you know, there's, gonna, there's unforeseen conditions, and a lot of times that's sheathing or fascia boards behind uh, mm -hmm. uh, aluminum uh, soffit coverings and, and so forth. So the community development does a good job in monitoring that. Yes, and any time we get a change order, we get pictures. The inspector requires them first off, and then I, I want to see what, what are we okay in here? So, yes. And Megan is going to speak about the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Can we, can we go back before you leave the, the presentation? Can you explain, uh, we, give a ch we give chip funds to a homeowner and then they immediately go out and flip their house, right? No. <laughs> okay, why don't you tell us about that? Well, they can, but they owe us some money back. Let's, let's, let's talk about that a bit because this is, this is not a uh, fix the house up and then they move in, in, in three months because they got a new roof and a new furnace at the uh, taxpayer's expense. Can you tell us how we control that, please? Yes. When a homeowner agrees to have private owner rehab work done on their home, um, they fill out a contract with us. They fill out the paperwork. We put a lien on their property. Uh, we record it with the recorder. Within that, we have a promissory note that states each year for five years, I believe it's 17% comes off of their balance. So if we did $35,000 worth of work, once they're there a year, 17% comes off of that 35,000. At the end of five years, we are down to a zero balance. So should the person pass away, move, uh, within that five years, that money is, is due to the county and it goes into our program income fund, which is where we do additional uh, private owner rehab projects. Now, you know, some people may think that five years is not satisfactory since you're getting a roof that should last 15 20. plus years, uh, but those requirements are determined at a higher level than, than us. Correct. Correct. So we, we just actually adhere to the standard. We don't create the standard locally, uh, but at least there is some clawback provisions in these funds so that we can limit the amount of potential abuse that, that comes into this funding. We haven't had too many problems with that. I think we had somebody pass away and... That's, that's mostly where we get our program right. income money from is people who have, have passed and, away. Right, and the family members didn't want, they wanted us to release the, the lien, they didn't want to pay the lien, and, but we, we always seem to work through those things. And, and I just think it's important that the taxpayers understand we're not giving away their money. Uh, thank you. Hello. Hi, I'm just going to briefly talk about the um, NSP program. Just a quick little overview of because that's an additional way we invest into housing in Lorain County. Um, so we have rehabbed four homes. Um, three have sold. One is currently on the market. Um, we also work with Elyria with the, the program. Um, dollars are allocated to Elyria to do their own rehab. Um, they have done two homes. Um, so the county has invested around uh, $370,000 into the four homes in acqui acquiring and uh, rehabbing the home. And Elyria, with the two homes that they have done um, with acquisition and rehab, they have done around 230000 for a total of around $600,000. And then currently we have 1826 West 22nd Street on the market. Um, that is on the market for $76,000. And then I'm kind of hand it back over to Linda to talk about what's coming soon with the uh, CHIP grant. Why don't we back up on the NSP funds, talk about mm -hmm. that a little bit. Can you go back to the last slide? 
actually two back. Yeah. The the uh, when these houses are sold, what happens to the funds? It's program income. And what are we able to do with that program income after that? We re reinvest it into the program by acquiring more houses to rehab, or um, we also do demo. Now, kind of refer to Don a little bit since being new. I'm not fully. You're a little nervous. It's okay. <laughs> Don't worry. And we we all have to stand up there eventually. Yeah. Right. Uh, and that's fine. We can talk with Don. Uh, the the uh, a lot of times these homes are rehabbed at, at a cost that exceeds the uh, sale price because uh, the location of the homes. Uh, however, this is uh, let me we'll go back to what it's called stabilization, mm -hmm. and and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Cannot continue to tear every house uh, that's in bad condition down because nobody's coming back to rebuild the housing stock. Mm -hmm. We've had some successes at this, but the program money dwindles. We do get some from the sales, but each time the pool of funds doesn't become greater, it becomes less uh, until there'll be a point where we're no, able, no longer able to do the rehabs. Uh, and I think O'Leary is going to return the program money to us this time rather than redo. They've, they've done recy recycling the money before, but not this time, correct? Uh, correct. Uh, if uh, they come up with another project, then we would uh, review it with the city. And uh, if it seems to be something uh, that uh, is consistent with the program and what we've been attempting to do and reinvest in the neighborhoods, then we would bring it to the board for your consideration and approval to reinvest those funds in Illyria. And then for the houses that have been acquired by the county, we have, uh, we acquired and uh, sold one in the city of Lorraine and the one on the market is also in the city of Lorraine. So we're working uh, throughout our target areas and uh, within the city of Lorraine, we're doing it ourselves uh, at this point in time. Now, we, we re-engaged in the city of Lorraine because they backed out of any of the completion of the NSP projects and we took over all the city of Lorraine project, correct? Correct. Uh, they concentrated on uh, some demolition and uh, we picked up on the uh, acquisition rehabilitation and have done well. Between the NSP uh, 1 and NSP 2 funds, we've brought in, in, in excess of a few million dollars, correct? Uh, the NSP 1 was approximately, by the time we were done, uh, we in Lorraine County, because we did have a little bit with uh, Erie and um, I think the city of Norwalk. We invested uh, over 2.1 million. Uh, we constructed four homes in Sheffield Township. Uh, we construct, we acquired and rehabbed and sold, I think in a weekend, uh, two, <laughs> two houses in Sheffield Lake uh, using a, an innovative uh, method of hiring actually a private developer that actually acquired the houses, did the rehab, and we had about a week to be able to turn them over to meet the program guidelines. And then we were able to get the state to allow us to reinvest some of that program income in. So between the two, I've, we've invested now in housing uh, overall, both demolition and uh, rehab uh, and some, a little bit of land banking about $3.6 million, and we continue right. to right. reinvest. Yeah, funds. I think that one in Sheffield Lake was the infamous garage one with the <laughs> with the, the problem that we had uh, yeah. and the contract they didn't take care of. But uh, uh, just for an update, the, the Norwalk piece was that we were the lead applicant on the grant process, uh, so we, we had to monitor Norwalk's uh, uh, NSP funds they used there. I think their program is, is finished. Yes, actually all the program income has been returned. Uh, the state has it and I think they uh, they use it for special projects here and there uh, but they haven't put out a proposal for us to pursue additional NSP1 program monies. So Commissioner it's not just that we've been able to achieve through you, you allowing us to uh, and three million dollars worth of rehab that money provides jobs here in Lorain County that put people to work uh, uh, when they're working on these homes and it continues to turn to our economy uh, you know you've heard me over and over again like a broken record we got to bring dollars in here we got to bring our tax dollars back home we got to we got to stop exporting and import so anytime we get grant money it's either from the state the federal government uh, that really improves the overall condition of our community not simply the housing stock but the jobs and the spending uh, that goes on so it's a great it's a great enhancement to our, uh, our economy here in Lorain County you know that important word is stabilization you know it's important to stabilize uh, especially the real estate market in Lorain County I mean if you live on a street where you've got a problem house uh, 
good luck on your property value. That's your biggest investment. It'll drive it down, no question about that. I know the uh, my house in Elyria had uh, three foreclosures on my street, and uh, you know I know what it did to my property values. But anytime you have a an issue with the property, and you know that's where the land banks come in. That's where you know uh, stabilization programs have come in, and it's all about. Uh, because that house can be a couple streets over from your house, and if you're trying to sell, uh, good luck on the impact that's going to have on your value too. So it's, it's just good to keep the values uh, stabilized and, and preferably going in the upward direction. As, as, as one last comment, because I, something dawned on me, and, and not everybody's eligible for these funds. Uh, correct. Uh, so I don't want to. I don't want you to phone and be ringing off the hook for the next three weeks for the few people that do watch this meeting. <laughs> so maybe we should indicate uh, what the proper um, targeted audience for these funds are. Uh, first of all, if you do have a question, feel free to just give us a call. We'll, we'll handle the phone call volume. But at what uh, number? <laughs> at uh, four four zero three two eight two three. 22 that is our main number uh, and that'll bring you up Rosie Williams and you can ask for Linda uh, Blanchett Drake Hopewell or Megan Wainwright uh, any of the three of them then would be able to assist the person on uh, the income because it is based on family size it does get a little convoluted but essentially we have for the chip uh, programs uh, two key levels one is 50 percent or less of area median income for a family uh, the other is 80% or less, and that is the highest level that we can assist on the housing programs. Uh, so you, usually we're working with low to moderate income correct. families and seniors. Correct. Now, there is one thing. On NSP, uh, Congress did give us, and again, because of neighborhood stabilization, a different income set that we can go up to. And uh, that is 120% of area median income. So that is one program where we can actually help middle or uh, upper middle income uh, families to get into a house as well. But we also are committed and by statute to also make housing available for those at 50% or less. And that 100 that 120 is the NSP for selling the home. For selling because the home. Because what they're trying to do is, is reintroduce uh, uh, people into the neighborhoods that that that's an incentive for them to buy in that neighborhood mm -hmm. so we can lift lift the neighborhood uh, so that's why they set that rate a little bit higher uh, and it's a little bit further up than just low to moderate income so. mm -hmm. thank you good job I have to put a plug in <laughs> And um, to go back to what Don said, in the, in the CHIP grant that we did, re we are receiving for $1,062,500, um, there are no um, Ohio Housing Trust Fund dollars in that. That is where the 50% uh, rule runs. So we won't have that in, the, in this new CHIP grant. It's just the 80%. And HUD puts out those levels. Uh, so we can tell the people when they call in, as soon as they call in, how many people are in your house, what do you make, do you think you may be eligible, you may not be eligible. The, uh, like I said, the uh, kickoff meeting will be October the 5th at 6 p.m., conference room B. It's open to the public, anyone interested in receiving these funds. It is for homeowners only. They must own the property. They must have their taxes, property taxes, mm -hmm. up to date. Uh, or working on a payment plan. We do like to see that. Um, and that's it. Thank Very you. Okay. Nice presentation. Good job. And I bet you people didn't know you did all that. <laughs> Resolutions. Number one, investments. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Lundy. Aye. Mr. Kalo. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Appropriations. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Lundy. Aye. Mr. Kalo. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Transfers. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Lundy. Aye. Mr. Kalo. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. No advances, no repayments, requisitions. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Lundy. Aye. Mr. Kalo. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Travel. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Lundy? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Bills? So moved. Second. Discussion? Mr. Lundy? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Under the airport, award contract to Erie Blacktop Sandusky in the amount of $799,825.11 
for taxiway B East and West project paid from the airport capital improvement construction account. Issue notice to proceed on or before September 28th, complete on or before June 30th, 2017, and authorize the administrator to notify the auditor to release retainage at completion of project. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Cordes, this is 95% money. It is 95% money. We're receiving 5% from the state uh, um, through their, their ODOT program. Uh, we provide 5% locally. We were able to enhance these funds because, you knew, as you remember, we saved some funds on the round of bids for the, ex, uh, the original taxiway mm -hmm. rehab program. Uh, so we were able to do a little bit more work at the airport. As, as we've been talking about, and you're going to hear me say it mm -hmm. until you're no longer up here, you take these dollars, it's a 20-year marriage. Um, the, it's I, a shotgun I, marriage. It's a shotgun marriage. It's <laughs> more than a shotgun marriage. It, it, it's 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 tough. It's it's really it's really a difficult relationship. They give us just enough money to to, to get the minimum standards met uh, and the work done at the airport, uh, and then they they basically hold us hostage. But for forty thousand dollars in local money, we're doing eight hundred thousand dollars in improvements. And it's county spent, airport. It will have to be done one way or the other. It has to be. You have to do this work regardless <laughs> if you take whether you take these funds or not. Correct. Uh, they'll come out. They'll tell you the standards, and you don't want their funding. They just go away, and they they court order you to provide uh, work to that standard. A lot of people still get aggravated over the airport. I will tell you, you know, when I'm out in the community, there's there's a lot of discontentment about the airport there's there's a lot of people that misunderstand the airport they misunderstand your involvement with the airport right. and why you keep that waste of taxpayers money open and that's quoted their opinion their opinion uh, and I try to explain but a lot of times they're already angry and they don't really want to listen much but this work has to be done you you owe the FAA 20 years from the last dollar you took I think about three months ago you took about a million bucks so you have to you know even if you don't take this, you still got 19.8 years or so. Well, the issue being it just shows you those local investment dollars, what it can bring back, no different than our sales tax issue number 32, right. dedicating it towards transit, mm -hmm. what 4 million bucks can turn into eventually mm -hmm. on well, you, the match. If you churn out for the work here and you, you take a responsible amount of churning at three, usually it's a lot more than that, but right. at the low end three, you can see how much economic investment that is in the community. Uh, well, and. Again, that's the importing of taxpayer dollars. Let me also point out that if we don't take these federal dollars that flow into communities, into this community, they go into other ones, we already realize we're a donor community on multiple levels, and this would just make us a bigger donor community. And I'm sure the employees at Very Blacktop are quite happy that we spent 40 grand to bring 800 grand here so they can go to work and do the repairs also. Well, remember, we did about $3 million worth of concrete work yep. last year. Uh, that was the concrete and all the work was provided locally too. Right. So very important bringing those dollars in. When you talk about job development, job creation, when you bring these dollars in and companies who are local are going to work, local workers are earning a living and recontributing back to the economy. Yes, sir. Yeah, I know it's popular for people to always talk about making cuts in government. Why don't you cut here? Why don't you cut there? And I've always talked about the opportunity that we have to actually bring in uh, matching dollars or two to one dollars you know in, in the case with the federal government when you deal with the airports it's a, normally a 90 10 uh, split on that and you know all day long I put ten dollars on the table if you're gonna give me ninety dollars back uh, and that's where I think sometimes the public doesn't understand that if we just had the dollars on the table all the additional dollars that we can actually bring in and that's a another example of uh, you know how we hope to grow transit as well too through uh, through issue 32 um, by being able to put uh, three four million dollars on the table uh, the hope is we'll be able to bring in uh, those federal dollars to those matching dollars um, that will make it possible for us to you know to grow transit should we be successful with issue 32 well you know the, the interesting thing with uh, FAA dollars they have that 20-year requirement uh, before uh, you can shut the airport down. The FTA has a depletion schedule on assets. So assets that are bought with FTA money, such as the Transportation Center, the Community Center, uh, has about a 28 to 30 year life uh, depletion schedule. So even if you were to go out of the transit business tomorrow, you would have to, if you sold the facility, all the money would be called back to the FTA and none of it would remain locally. 
So that, you know, working with the federal agencies, they, it's not a streamlined process, and they're not all the same of how they regard and, and uh, respond to uses of federal funds. And back before when there was an airport board, um, tell what the amount of money that the commissioner's general fund was putting towards the airport. Today we're only putting 50,000 plus matching dollars well, for these grants. Actually, it's a, it's a really good conversation, and I'll try to be brief. The, uh, I, back around 2006, I think was the last time we had an airport authority, they had quite a few employees. They were spending about 650 to 700,000 a year. 95% uh, of that was pretty much going to the employee base. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had some you know, up and down relationship issues with them and, and the commissioners decided that they wanted to do something different with the airport to reduce overall operating cost. You, uh, you uh, basically did away with the, the airport authority. We did a, a public private partnership with an operator of the airport uh, that takes care of the maintenance and the mowing of the grass. We also have a private FBO operator that we have a contract with. I will tell you the facilities are rather depleted, but we've been able to go into our 10th year in, in that model. We're on our second vendor with the FBO. Similar partners, but a different, a different entity uh, came out of that partnership. Uh, and yes, the general fund has given a 50,000. To be more, the fully transparent though, at times you've given additional grant match money over the 50,000 if we didn't have it in the budget. It hasn't been significant as you see here mm -hmm. uh, to bring those monies back. Our biggest revenue producer at the airport is? Farming. Farming. <laughs> Growing corn is our biggest uh, income uh, provider at the airport, but we do get a portion of tie down fees. Uh, we get a percentage of uh, fuel sales and things that are done out there. At times, the overall operation at the airport budget, when it goes online, and this is where people get really confused because a lot of people do read that stuff. It could be five or six hundred thousand a year, but it's not five or six hundred thousand dollars of general fund money. Uh, uh, part of that is taxpayers' money because federal money is taxpayers' money. ODOT money from the state is taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. I always love those people that say, "Well, it's not taxpayers' money because it didn't come locally." It, it is taxpayers' money. But, but there's a couple hundred thousand dollars that come in from the activities at the airport. And I think the corn growing right now is about $130,000 a year uh, of that budget. And of course, the, the FAA doesn't really appreciate that because birds like corn and we grow corn and birds and airplanes don't really agree with each other all the time. So they would prefer that we're not growing anything on the land out there, but unfortunately we need the revenue to keep the airport operating. Uh, we've done everything but grow corn on the roof of the buildings out there. Every square inch that was uh, we could put under the plow we have. And hopefully one day we won't have to do that. Uh, because as you know, we've been developing a, for a long period of time, an industrial park out on the lands uh, in the front on Russia Road. Don and I have been dusting off the plans again. The economy's getting better. Uh, we just kind of shelved that stuff during the recession. <laughs> Uh, but we're, we're re-looking at our plans and hoping to get some grant monies to revisit that issue out there. And one day, maybe there'll be there'll be some some uh, significant uh, building out there. Thank you, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lundy. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Authorized various personnel actions as indicated on the summary sheet for employees within the jurisdiction of Marion County Commissioners. That would be Administrator Cordes. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I do have a, a few issues I want to yeah. talk with the board about. Um, I want to discuss uh, uh, the soon to start uh, uh, labor negotiation with United Auto Workers of America and our Job and Family Services employees. Uh, fact finding that took place with the United Steel Workers of America, uh, employees here in, in, in the, mostly in the administrative building, uh, and our, uh, some, some things that have come out of that, especially since we approved the UAW contract last week. Um, and uh, how that affects the, the bargaining with the United Auto, excuse me, the United Steelworkers. Uh, also pending, not pending, uh, imminent uh, litigation um, and potential sale and purchase of real estate. I do not have any potential hires today, uh, so the other topics are allowable under the Sunshine Act for executive session discussion, so I'd ask at the conclusion of our meeting, we go into executive session and talk about those items I've identified. Thank you. Wave and read the meeting. Wait, approve and wave the reading of the minutes. <laughs> That's of September rare. 14th. I know. Boo. Yeah, yeah. So move. <laughs> Second. Discussion. Mr. Monday. Aye. Mr. Kayla. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Issuance of not to exceed two million three hundred twenty-five thousand series 2016B capital improvement plan improvements bond anticipation notes 
for purpose of paying cost of construction and acquiring improvements to various county owned properties, including HVAC improvements, roof repair and replacement, sidewalk, parking lot, storm, sewer, landscape, security, and other site and building improvement together with all necessary appurtenances thereto. Yeah, so move. Second. Discussion. You guys want to talk about anything? Well, I know we have Let's a wrap it number of these if you can tie them all together, right? We're going to do them one by one. Which ones? Who Whichever one you want to do, Commissioner. I, we're doing over $10 million worth of borrowing. I don't have the exact figure. Maybe Lisa does. We're about, what, 10, 10 million, 300,000 now? We're about at about 10, 8, not to exceed all of these. So, uh, you know, we're getting, we're getting into some big numbers, but, uh, uh, this one here, and it's probably better if we just take them one at a time rather than complicate it. This one here is for the capital improvement work that we started doing about two years ago. We're rolling the notes. Um, we came to a, a juncture in, uh, in the road uh, that simply we had to make some tough decisions about how to keep our um, buildings and um, capital uh, assets in good repair. We owe it to the taxpayers to do that. Uh, whether they want us to spend the money on the roof or not, uh, we're not allowed to apply for chip money if yeah, you know, the roof doesn't work. Right? Uh, so the board uh, embarked upon a capital improvements project program, and we've been new roofs, new sidewalks, things that had uh, not been taken care of over a long period of time. Uh, but I will tell you, we've also had to purchase you know, different assets, such as vehicles for the sheriff's department mm -hmm. and so forth under this, under this bond. Uh, excuse me, notes, we haven't gone to permanent bonding yet. Uh, I'm hoping that this is the, the, the last round and we can go to some permanent financing on this um, in the future. Uh, but we're also coalescing all of these notes at the same point. I, I really haven't told Lisa, so I'll state it here. I, I, I told our underwriter to do uh, callables on these notes so that we wanted to peel off certain portions of these notes, even though they're they've been consolidated that we can do specific bonding should the need arise. The, 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 the additional cost for us to do that is negligible. It's very few basis points. And I think it's, it's necessary uh, given the, the, uh, uh, the revenue situation going forward that we may want to isolate off portions of this at some time. But if, if things improve, then we'll, we'll obviously do a super bond at some time in the future. You look a little confused, Commissioner. I was just thinking some of these bonds are the revenue has their, its own dedicated revenue source. Well, some will, and that's what we're going to, as we go down the list, some of these are revenue bonds. This is a GEO. This would be a GEO bond here. Whether we do a GEO or we do it revenue bond, we can still do a super bond, drive down the, uh, the issuance cost, thereby reducing the overall effective rate on the bond. We just account for the payments manually uh, so that we do that. Lisa has been quite good at, at doing that over the last decade. Uh, I, I don't like doing seven little bonds. It, it does drive up the cost of issuance. The cost of issuance on $10 million is not much more than it is on $2 million. Uh, so if we can consolidate those, we can get an, a, a better overall all-in rate when you figure the cost of issuances. That is the fee to underwriters, the fee to bond counselors, the et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. Uh, that's why we never really want to do anything less than a, it used to be a million, but I would say probably a million and a half now because it just gets, it just gets a little bit too costly. But we may, when I say peel off parts of this, we may want to see if the treasurer is interested in picking up a couple pieces of this like we did before because the best producing income bonds in this portfolio are our revenue bonds from some of our sewer projects. Recognizing that revenue bonds will always be paid. There's some defaults that go on if a property goes uh, behind on their taxes or their assessments, but those things are recouped when the property is eventually sold. Right. And so revenue bonds are the gold standard uh, that, that you know, will pay. Uh, and, and so we put a couple of those into the treasurer's portfolio. He's agreed to that. And they, they actually have been handsomely producing results in, in that portfolio. So I just want to keep those options alive going forward, and then we can make some decisions uh, in the next year. I think you made an important point, you know, the, and we can't say it enough times, the public owns all these buildings. They do. They own them all. We were elected to manage, and, uh, you know, when we see issues and concerns, we have to make sure there's an upkeep, and, you know, I hate to think what would have, uh, what the future would hold for the courthouse if we weren't making improvements there. You know, our veteran services absolutely needed to get into a, a new facility. Uh, something that was badly needed and 
you know, it's, it's no different from home ownership. You know, after so many years, you got to put a new roof on, you got to take care of the windows and the downspouts and all kinds of things. And, you know, government buildings aren't immune from what your home is uh, subject to each and every day. Um, so you, there are your buildings. We want to take care of your buildings. You've elected us to manage these buildings, but there's costs associated with it. And, uh, you know, I can't say enough about the severity of our financial situation. We are in a very, very bad situation. There's many days I wake up and I'm thinking, wow, I actually ran for this office. Uh, <laughs> I tried to warn you. Talk about, talk about coming in at a really, really bad time. Uh, we're, we're in a bad financial situation. I can't stress that uh, enough to the public. But, you know, these costs don't go away. And you know that as a homeowner, whether it's heating your home, uh, whether it's paying the water bill, the sewer bill, wh whatever it may be, these expenses don't go away. We have the same expenses that you have with your home. Uh, as I said, these are your buildings. We're wanting to make sure we manage them properly so that we can keep them up. And, uh, uh, you know, it's expensive to go out and build new. Anybody will tell you that. A lot of borrowing with that. But it's just unfortunate that we're in a position these days that we have to do as much borrowing as we need to do to, to keep pace. I, uh, I have a long enough tenure with the county to tell you that we always paid for cash for our capital improvements we saved. We kept it in uh, rollover funds, uh, unappropriated, and then we did big projects with cash. That, uh, say, <laughs> that ship has set sail a long time ago to be able to do that, and I don't see those, those days returning for a significant period of time. So we're going to have to finance our capital improvements. The biggest issue I have with the whole thing is what you brought up earlier and that's buying sheriff's cars that by the time these bonds are paid those sheriff's cars will be in the junkyard um, but what do we do we have to have police cruisers for our sheriff's deputies to drive around in that are safe and functioning well we're usually spending two to three hundred thousand dollars a year on vehicle replacement cost that's big. money that's just not available right now um, and that doesn't make the need go away because there's no funds. I, I often read um, some comments in the community that we should just reduce our spending, but when the car has 165,000 miles on it, how do you reduce spending? Or you, what do you do? You have to have that vehicle. You have to provide for the safety in the community. I don't mean to alarm people. That's not the only problem. Cars at the police department are not our single issue. Some of this capital improvement dollars were in, in the jail. Uh, there was you know, shallow walls that people could have just pushed over that needed replacement after a number of years in the old section of the jail. There's, there's a lot going on and there's a lot of need and we have several hundreds of thousands of square foot on the roof that we manage. Those assets need to be, as I said, managed and they need to be well taken care of into the future generations. This building here is 55 years old excuse me, 30, 45 years old. And the, what the things we're doing to this building, we'll get another 30 or 40 years out of it. Uh, the Justice Center was, was built to be at least a 50 to 100 year building mm -hmm. and we provided for the extra space that at times has been uh, contentiously challenged on the fifth floor as, as for future growth of the Debated. Justice. Debated. Debated. Friendly debate. Uh, but but well, let's also <laughs> not forget that we, we have a significant problem with our parking garage. Mm -hmm. I can, <laughs> we, can, we can ignore that as much as possible. That's the uh, elephant shivering under the carpet. And nobody thinks there's a lump there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's bad. It's only going to get worse. And that's going to be millions of dollars. And, and what we're going to do, I don't know. Uh, people are going to say, well, just tear it down, but the building was constructed to have a garage. There's doors along the back of the building. There's stairs to the, to the doors that lead to the garages, and there's a lot of reconfiguration that would need to be done to uh, even put a flat lot back there and take the garage out. So the list is long and lengthy, the things balconies. that need to be done. We can do balconies. Seating for lunch. Yeah. I understand, Commissioner. Uh, it, the, uh, but this is not the end of things. This is simply, you know, we need to find an endpoint and go to bonding, and then we have to talk about the other needs in the county. <coughs> and, 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 of course, uh, folks don't really want to hear about that, but, but that's what we have to do. If you, you're either faulted because you spend money on something or you're faulted because you let it fall apart. It's, it's yeah. the better of which evil. I'd rather <coughs> leave something for future generations and be criticized for that than to be criticized for doing nothing. 
I know when we first did the improvements here on the fourth floor, one of the, we got criticized for that heavily. Uh, but I know <clears throat> one major thing, when we resealed the windows, we didn't replace them, but we resealed them. What a difference in, I'm sure, utilities uh, had to have improved because of that. You could hear everything out on the street oh, yes. prior to those resealing of those windows. So, well, it, we, I mean, it sound, almost soundproofed my office from they, the, just they, that. If, if you recall, uh, they wanted to replace the windows in the building. Uh, I didn't think the recovery cost of the window replacement was was significant enough to, to warrant replacing because the, the ROI just wasn't there. It would have been nice to have new state-of-the-art windows with a higher E, and that would have driven some of our costs down. Now, we drove a lot of it down by redoing all the seals and so forth, but we were able to take a $500,000 project, turn it into a $50,000 project, and achieve, achieve about 80% of the results that we were looking for had we replaced the windows. It made a significant difference. It did. Uh, so you know, we're, we're working real hard on that, and, and we did the energy conservation upgrade. I'm, I'm happy to tell you our energy conservation bonds are paid off this year. So we're, we're done. Woo woo. Uh, uh, some of the savings from that now, rather than going to debt service, will be maintained in the departments so that we'll have a little bit of extra flexible dollars in our utility accounts. But, but uh, don't get too excited because uh, I'm looking at a, a new round of energy conservation upgrades, technology has changed in the last 10 years, lighting technology has changed. Uh, we need to start moving to an LED environment. We need to look at uh, some of our fixtures. People are going to go, well, it looks fine. It does, but there's still potential to do all those upgrades, lower our carbon footprint, lower our energy costs, and pay for that with the savings from the current energy bill uh, going forward. And we need to be a pioneer in that so that other people see that it can be done. So that, that'll be coming to you sometime next year. Okay. Mr. Lundy. Aye. Mr. Kalo. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Issuance of not to exceed 600000 county building acquisition bond anticipation notes for the purpose of paying cost of acquiring a building for county use, including the Veterans Service Commission, together with all necessary appurtenances thereto. So moved. Second. Let me, let me make it clear that the building's already bought and they're already in it. <laughs> right. uh, it's just that we, we need to get some additional funds uh, under that resolution uh, because we're doing some further work out there. Great place. Have the veterans stop by. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm excited. We're, we're finally going to get the signage done here shortly out there. We're working on that. Uh, our relationship with the veterans is better than it's ever been. I really like working with Terry Stone. Uh, and and uh, hopefully uh, the, uh, we'll, we, the veterans will have a chance to stop out there. They got great curb appeal, and the, the VA clinic is out there on Abbey Road. They did a great job cleaning up that whole area over there, and the corridors are easy access. And I'm hearing nothing but positive uh, comments from the veterans. I know that there was some negativity uh, about wanting to locate it down in Lorraine, and uh, when the VA clinic moved, but but uh, all in all, it's been a very positive experience. You're nothing but good comments coming from. Uh, both the v veteran service office and the veterans clinic um, and then just having them nearby each other's uh, the veterans are very happy about that mr. Lundy aye mr. Kyle aye. Ms. Kowski. aye issuance of not to exceed two million eight hundred thousand or eighty thousand courthouse renovation project on anticipation notes for purpose of paying the cost of renovating the county courthouse together with all necessary appurtenances so moved second discussion Please, uh, <laughs> this is not all the funds. No, no, no. So no, no. let me make that clear uh, that uh, there'll be additional borrowing. This is only to have enough funds on hand and cash flow to start moving through the project. I anticipate probably another million dollars on top of this. Uh, there's there's uh, there's going to be a lot of work, and. In order to expand the third floor of the courthouse, it was probably the most expensive square footage I've ever seen in my life. If you don't do it now, it'll be twice as expensive later on to try to go back in. But because of the very nature of the courthouse, the way it has to be the third floor, because it really is very limited amount on the third floor, because those are the old courtrooms that opened up into the big, huge ceilings. Doing that expansion there, which after talking to the courts, I believe is going to be necessary for the, for the near future, at least for the far future, but more in the near term than we had anticipated before because of some changes by the state, which I don't want to go into right now. Um, 
that required that we upgrade the, the, the building to, to a different fire standard because we were significantly increasing some of the floor area. So we had to put a fire suppression system into the building. Uh, that fire suppression system alone is between six and seven hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. The the uh, so it added. Well, you need fire booster. Well, we're, actually, we don't have fire booster pumps. We're, we believe we can go without the booster pumps, but if anything changes and we can't <coughs> maintain the load pressure and the lift, we're, we're going to have some additional costs in the booster pump. But the suppression system in the build out alone was six or seven to seven hundred fifty thousand. This should the courthouse should be in shape for 25, 30 years. Oh, I was. Really, I would think outside improvements, the drawing out of the building. Commissioner, I would think longer. Um, the the uh, of course we're going to be criticized. You might as well get ready for that because we're, we are going to deforest the outside of the courthouse. It, it we we talked about this 10 years ago, but for various reasons we were prevented from doing that. The building simply doesn't dry out in the spring, summer, and fall. It, it's too shaded. The, the brick stays damp, and I should say brick. Excuse yes, me, sandstone, sandstone stays mm -hmm. damp. We need we need to get a lot more air circulation. We need to get the sun on the building. Uh, so there's all of that's going to change. Uh, but the stabilization that you're doing work, I would suggest if you do routine maintenance, 50 years. The only thing I anticipate of a major uh, cost issue to the county during that period would be replacement of that metal roof they usually last 50 or 60 years that one's about 25 years old now there's no sense replacing it now it still has a good right, service right. life left in it but it's not a forever roof uh, i won't be around in those days to explain <coughs> that so maybe somebody will look back at the archives and know why we didn't put a roof on it when we did this major renovation but it still has a significant mm -hmm. service life left in it and there's no reason to uh, replace that right now i do know the you know the leaders of O'Leary are thrilled about uh, the work we're gonna, going to do on the courthouse. Main Street is uh, the historical society members and a lot of people I've run into in the in the community. Uh, you know, uh, there were some in the past who wanted it to be a homeless shelter or meet the wrecking ball, um, but we are you know going to have a viable government use for this. It's not just a matter of putting money into it to, to make a building look good. It's going to be a functional government building, and. Uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of heritage and history with this building. It's really, I think, the the most important landmark that we have in the county, probably in addition to our to our lighthouse. Um, and uh, it's 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 an investment uh, that's a wise investment because there's actually going to be a, a, a solid functional government use uh, for that building. But once again, uh, trying to make any improvements to a facility, there's costs that you incur. And um, but I think when the project is completed. Uh, the community be, will be very happy with the investment that's been made. Mr. Lundy. Aye. Mr. Kayla. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Issuance of not to exceed two million forty thousand series 2016 B job and family services capital improvement bond anticipation notes for purpose of paying cost of constructing and acquiring improvements to Lorraine County job and family services building, including HVAC improvements, roof repair and replacement, sidewalk, parking lot, sewer, landscape security, and all other site and building improvements, together with all necessary appurtenances thereto and providing additional project funds. So move. Second. Discussion. Yeah, I, I, uh, this is one I like. Uh, uh, we've been working with uh, the state. Our bonds for the building uh, matured and paid <coughs> off this year. So the building was finally paid free and clear, but that's that was 20 years ago that the last major renovation was conducted on this building. Uh, I don't think it would, even then it was as comprehensive as I would have liked uh, to see, but uh, I wasn't in charge of those type of things back in, in the uh, early to mid 90s. Uh, I thought the, the cost would be a little bit lower, but it's $900,000 to uh, repair the roof and stabilize it and get an additional warranty on it or it's about 1.2 or 3 million to replace it. Uh, we had anticipated the repair cost at about a half a million at best, uh, but after we did a uh, thermal analysis of the roof, and I guess I'll tell you what that is, they come in, they actually do thermal picturing and they can tell if there's moisture under the roof and the, and the substrate and it's really kind of some neat state-of-the-art stuff. Tech. <laughs> yeah, rather than trying to peel it back and eyeball it, uh, they, they can tell from the various heat densities and the absorptions and 
uh, whether you have additional damage to the roof. That's avoid some of those unforeseen conditions. They're not really doing that on residential properties, but they do do them on commercial properties now. The state has agreed to uh, reimburse us uh, to the level of expenditures. I wanted that locked up, and that's where I was going with that. We'll recover these costs to pay this bond uh, from the state for use of the building uh, through uh, chargebacks, through, uh, indirect cost, and rental and rent for the square footage. Uh, if you don't spend this money, you still own the building, and you don't get the improvements, and the state don't give us the money. I guess that's it in a nutshell. Yep. Needs to be done. Mr. Lundy. Aye. Mr. Gala. Aye. Mr. Kasky. Aye. Issuance and not to exceed two million six hundred fifteen thousand Series B sanitary sewer improvement Redfern Road project bond anticipation notes for purpose of paying the cost of constructing and acquiring sanitary sewer system improvements, including sewer line, force main, lift station, and other improvements together with all necessary appurtenances there too, and to provide additional project funds. So move. Second. Discussion. Sewer's so in, it's up and running. Um, everything's operating out there, so it's not as if we're building the sewer. It's built with with our arrangement for working with the developers to get the sewers completed out there uh, until they get some of the lots developed and, and the, uh, all of that sold and some building underway. We agreed to stay in notes and recapitalize the interest in the notes. I um, think that probably next year we will we will peel this off and go to uh, permanent bonding. Um, because we'll have been in it for a year or two at that point, but we'll have further discussion on that. These are the revenue bonds you spoke to. They're guaranteed by property assessment. No existing property owners were affected. There was free sewers for the existing property owners, uh, so we were able to work it out with developers. The sewer is strictly right now for all new development, all new lots, all new building that's going on out there. It was a good win-win proposition for the homeowners that were affected along the way, along the sewer route, because they weren't assessed for any sewers. Uh, just tap-ins. Uh, well, certain tap-ins. Mm -hmm. And as you, I'm working with Redford Farms subdivision down on Redford Road right now. We anticipate that next fall uh, that subdivision, the 72 homes, the majority of that subdivision will be coming on to the Redford sewer. Uh, remember that dry sewers were installed by the developer out there. We did some work on the dry sewers. We've done the inspections. Unfortunately, they put dry sewers in, but there was no laterals from the homes installed to the dry sewer. The sewers were put in the street. The homeowners have on-site systems. The average age of the homes out there is 15 plus years. Normally that's when you start having uh, some issues with your on-site. You've at least gotten a lot of uh, service years out of it. Um, but we need to install laterals. Well, the homeowners need to install laterals from the home to the sewer at the road. I think they should have been installed by the developer and then capped. But, you know, in the future, maybe that's what happen will happen. I have been working with the HOA uh, on a program where we will do the financing if they can get enough homeowners lined up, we'll, we'll, we'll bring back contractors and we'll do all the lateral work for them, anybody that signs on board. We'll have the proper waivers in place and so forth. The economy of scales there. The mobilization, bringing somebody doing 40, 50 homes at one time really drives down the cost. Mm -hmm. I've also offered them on your behalf uh, the ability to self-assess the cost of that. We can do borrowing from it for the homeowners that want to put it on their assessment bill. They can do a voluntary assessment of that. Anything we can do to help homeowners because the average cost is still probably going to be four or five thousand uh, dollars. Some of the homes are deeper on deeper lots, uh, and then they have to collapse the on-site system. But I'm, I'm really working at innovative solutions so that these folks come onto this sewer, and 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 hopefully we don't have the aggravation that we usually have with folks. There'll probably be a couple. There always are, but we've offered some, some rather unique solutions for these people uh, to to make it less painful. But they, they knew eventually a sewer was coming down. That's why the dry sewers were put in the subdivision. So we need to tap that on the Redford Road sewer sometime next year. I hope to be completed in the fall. And, and then you know, we'll wrap up some of this financing. Mr. Lundy? Aye. Mr. Kayla? Aye. Ms. Kasky? Aye. Issuance on not to exceed $1,185,000 doesn't run sewer project bond anticipation notes for the purpose of paying the cost of project improvements, including engineering, testing, and inspection series together with all necessary appurtenances there too. So move. Second. Discussion. Revenue bond. <clears throat> However, I don't know that we're going to be going to bonding on this. We were able uh, to achieve an over $4 million loan uh, from the federal government at a significantly reduced interest rate. It's right around 2.2%. Mm -hmm. We can't borrow money that, that, that effectively ourselves. 
uh, I think the, the all-in project cost, when we do the on-site, we do the sewer, we do all that, will exceed that. So we, there may be some need for additional bonding. Uh, but right now I need cash, I need money, and I can't access those funds until we're further on on the loan program. So this is just to keep us moving on the project. We've had uh, quite a fair amount of hiccups on this project. It never ceases to surprise me what's coming out from behind a tree next. Uh, but I do believe that by the end of 2018, sometime late summer, early fall, we'll have the this project done. I had wanted that to be more quickly than that but you know the long tail of everything that's happened with this and and recognizing that sooner or later you guys will be subject to a lot of abuses from a lot of homeowners down there even though they all under their association banner approached us to uh, lift the burden of their problem with their package plan to offer off of those folks uh, let me make it clear they came to us you There's told us we'll go from hero to zero in a very short amount of time. As soon as they figure out that, that you're not paying for their sewer, and eventually they're going to have to pay for it, I think that you'll go to zero pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Not everybody, but, but some. You know how that works, Commissioner. You've been down that road before. You're, you're a pretty right. seasoned we'll veteran with that. And who else was going to help on that? Excuse me? Who else would have helped on that? Well, you know, they, they approached Walco. Uh, Walco did try to assist them. Uh, unfortunately, Walco's system is, is further away. They're... There is some additional cost that would be would be needed. Mm -hmm. uh, at first, it appears that Walco's cost would be less than ours, but Walco wasn't doing the on-site work. I, I have seen some, uh, some data on some some um, subdivision sewers that have amazed me of how they've been allowed to to, to be uh, degraded to such a point. Uh, but this is probably by far one of the worst I've seen down there in Pheasant Run. Uh, I mean, we have instances where you know. Mailbox has been punched through the through the sewer, and there's a post hanging in it. And there's some, we have one part of the sewer where they ran electrical cable and dangled it in the storm uh, in the uh, sanitary sewer, and uh, and the list goes on and on and on. And and if if we don't help these folks, the EPA is really going to um, bang them into a compliance that's going to cost them far more right. than than anything we're going to do here. Mm -hmm. And and those standards are always changing and they're always tightening so they're never going to get out from underneath this chokehold <coughs> with that plant down there not to mention the multiple layers of litigation because they're supposed to be able to sewer an additional 300 watts back there mm -hmm. that developers have that they owe them sewer to those developers mm -hmm. and there's always some seemingly cross litigation going on down there who's suing who and uh, hopefully this will alleviate the burden of all of that because this sewer is being built to service the 835 total lots and only 532 <coughs> or something like that right now are developed so we're uh, trying to help out but as always no good deed goes unpunished i guess you know not a week goes uh, by and i'm not getting smacked in the head over this wow. project from somebody but thank but, you sir may i have another <laughs> it's what we get paid to do commissioner uh -huh. yeah. you know you know it, uh, i didn't see in my job description that people are going to be happy about the results just that we need to get results mm -hmm. so the the uh we're, we're plotting on we're getting there okay. Mr. Lundy? Aye. Mr. Kevin? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Then we're going to consolidate the six bond anticipation notes issues of the Loring County in to a consolidated bond anticipation note issue and estimating the terms of such consolidated issues. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Lundy? Aye. Mr. Kevin? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Award contract to NNN Construction Company, Inc., Wakeman, for a phase one site development Lorraine County Courthouse renovation project. Two bids received, this being the most responsive, complying with specifications, and to be paid from the capital improvement account. Issue notice to proceed on or before September 28th and complete on before August 1st, 2017. Authorized administrator to notify the auditors to release completion of project. So moved. Second. And I just noticed I didn't have an amount in there. Did we? The uh, what was missing, Teresa? The amount. I didn't have an amount in there for some reason. It's um. Just give me a blank check. I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> The two hundred three thousand eight hundred ten dollars twenty-seven. The, the I yes. Let, let me tell you what we're we're, we're up to here. The you know, the, you, the city of Leary is working on Third Street, and <laughs> we're going to be doing work on on the portion of uh, the court court street that needs doing uh, on the parking lot uh, on the city side there. We're hoping to get that work done in conjunction with the city's work so we can we we don't step on each other's toes on the work that's why we're moving so quickly on this piece 
Normally, I would have preferred to do this piece after all of the, the construction and the renovation of the building was done, and usually you do your, your, that, that kind of work later. Um, so we're collaborating with them, and, and there's certain things that they're going to do that we need to reimburse them for under their Third Street work, and there's work that they're going to reimburse us for under this contract. Uh, we're, we're juggling it, but we're keeping it all uh, moving. Uh, but uh, after this work's done, the rest of the, um, the court, courthouse parking will be all blocked off, and I'll have more for you on next week on when we're going to make that change. But I told you, early October, we're, we're, we're moving everything over to the Broad Street building mm -hmm. and, and getting ready for operations over there. So the courthouse will be effectively shut down. From, they, they indicate to us late next year, I think it's going to be more into the into the very early spring of uh, the following year. There's going to be a lot of unforeseen conditions <coughs> in that building. Uh, we may find Jimmy Hoffer under there in one of the walls there, for all I know. It's, so this will be the first time that the courthouse has been completely emptied and renovated in 50 years. I mean, there's been updates to it, but it has not been emptied, completely everything taken out of it and, and work done on it. So it's going to be an interesting project. At the same time, it's going to be, there's going to be conditions that we need to be very flexible as we move forward with. It's too bad the Lorraine County developer didn't get the bid for this, though. From somebody from Wakeman, but well, you know, Commissioner, that's, that's the process of sealed bid. I know. It's it's. Um, let's point out that the uh, commissioner was sued because they had a local preference policy a few years back. They gave certain credits to local contractors to, to try to give them an enhancement uh, working with some of the bigger contracts in the surrounding community, especially Cuyahoga. We they, were being they, penalized. They was, remember, we, we got did. spanked in Columbus for. Well, you, you and I, I got, uh, we got pistol whipped, okay, pistol whipped. <laughs> in, in Columbus right. over, this, over, the, over the CHIP program. Right. And local. in fact, because we gave so much preference to locals and, they, and, and because the state was so upset about that and they said it was causing us not to get the qualified amount of bids, the qualified amount of contractors, they penalized us and took our CHIP program away right. for a round. You remember that? Yes, I do. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you that no matter how hard these poor people work, mm -hmm. we're still not getting a heck of a lot more bids without that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, we just, you see it's coming through with mm -hmm. one and two. We, we go out two, three times. Uh, you know, Linda's you know, out there all the time soliciting stuff. We send out all the faxes. We send out, we have the list. It hasn't changed when we had the program to what we have now. It's just right. that it gave the state a, an opportunity to strip us of our CHIP grant right. for a round. And so we complied because it's better that we comply than we get no chip right. from from the state. And that was a really aggressive, punitive move on their part, and it shouldn't have happened. Um, but but that said, the local we, we were sued over our three percent preference policy. Uh, a lot of our vendors here were getting beat out by Cuyahoga vendors because they had the economy of scale over our local folks. That worked for a couple years, and people were pretty happy with it. And 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 then we got sued, and we had a we had a withdraw from that program. So. It, it isn't because the board didn't have the, the heart and soul to try to work with, with right. local companies. You yeah. did. I wish that program was still in place. I know every time we make purchases around here, we try to make sure, I mean, those that aren't in a competitive bid situation, right. we try to make sure that local vendors have a chance to weigh in and give us some pricing and, you know, you keep those dollars local as much as you can so you can turn those dollars uh, locally. It helps keep people working and puts people to work. And um, But at the same time, I, you know, uh, the, the state has spoken on it, and uh, uh, so we have to comply with that. Who was it, Neil Armstrong, who said that he was flying to the moon on the, the, the lowest and cheapest bid for right. the work done? Yeah, on right. The, yeah, you wonder how <laughs> safe that flight's going to be. He did say that, didn't he? You're right. <laughs> you have that big rocket behind you as you're leaving the pad. This actually went to the lowest bidder. <laughs> Would you like to make a motion and a second to this? Um, so move. Second. Any further discussion? Mr. Lundy? Aye. Mr. Caleb? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Under Community Development Award contract at Green Home Solutions, Cleveland, amount of 46000 which includes contingency for any unforeseen change order for Michelle Davis at 151 Norman Avenue, Avon Lake, for grant assistance for the CHIP program year 14 private owner home rehab. So move. Second. Discussion? Mr. Lundy? Aye. Mr. Caleb? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Under sanitary engineer, entering a lease with U.S. Bank Equipment Finance for a 2017 Ford F-350 crew cab truck with a six-door utility body and snow plow package from Harrison Ford Wellington in the amount of $9,711.99 per year for five years. So moved. Second. Discussion? Mr. 
Lundy? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Mr. Cortez? I'm hoarse from all the conversation. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty well Talk done. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Ennis. Uh, I do have a couple of items, Commissioners. Um, one, I will need an executive session regarding several matters of pending and imminent litigation. Um, secondly, um, as you recall, we have an issue with a property owner in Carlisle Township on Grafton Road. Um, we were unable to reach agreement for, uh, in, in uh, purchasing a sewer e easement there, so we have to go through with eminent domain proceedings. We have uh, obtained the appraisal, and I now need to have you pass a formal resolution of necessity. So. Can we talk about this a bit before you want to do your? Yeah, well, I'll wait for your discussion, but I, I want to have some conversation. You're we'll going to make a motion, now? and we'll get to conversation. Or you want to? I'd rather get into this yeah, since we brought sure. the word eminent domain and the right. press is sitting right. out there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this has been one of the most painful, yes, long, drawn-out processes that should have been fairly simple. And and Kalau Township uh, uh, administrators here and. I may even have to drag him into the conversation, uh, <laughs> but but uh, some folks are just ornery, and some folks just don't care about their neighbors. I'm not saying these are those kind of folks, but I'm just making a point. Uh, we have some folks that have been flooding uh, out there uh, in the vicinity. Uh, we we did some work. There's an old drainage tile across these folks' property that goes into the river. The tile has failed, it's significantly failed. We've spent well in excess of two years uh, offering options and ways of doing this so that we could either replace, clear, do whatever's necessary to stop the flooding in a few of those homes out there. It really shouldn't have been a very hard or costly process and we just have not been able to retain the results and the cooperations we need. We have come so close so many times or we thought. You want me to detail? Why don't you? Why don't you start there? Uh, just, just so you know, efforts we went to to resolve with these people. Um, um, our estimate originally on, on the value of this was four thousand dollars. We knew if we had to go through eminent domain that it would probably cost uh, um, be another four thousand dollars. So we offered to give that to the landowners. We said we just as soon give it to you. Um, so we actually offered them double what we thought the value of. Um, they had some concern about some loss of some trees. We offered to plant new trees on their property. They were then concerned about the loss of some screening and some uh, uh, damage we might do to the neighboring properties. We offered to remove that. We threw in $2,000 more just to get the thing over with and when all was said and done, um, they didn't like the contractor that we obtained, even though the engineers uh, are using someone they've used very well and they use them because they do a very good cleanup and we didn't want cleanup properties, um, but they wanted us to use another contractor which was going to cost us an additional $3,000 just to use a different contractor. Since when does somebody else get to weigh in on? Who well, the I mean, I just want to show you the yeah. efforts that we went to, and then at the end, wow. they wanted us to spend three thousand dollars on a different contractor. It was who we have no history of experience with. We wanted to go with somebody reliable that we knew did a good job. Right, that we're familiar with, and we know exactly. the expectations. They have had three lawyers or two. I mean, well, they now have obtained a second lawyer. Second lawyer. Uh, the, the amount, I don't know how much they're spending, but I know how much we've spent. And, and with your permission and your agreement, we did decide that this was a taking. What was going to be our cost of all of this, since we didn't really want to take property, give it to them all. Mm -hmm. Make it easy. We're going to spend that much money anyway. We don't want to do a taking. What is it going to cost? The appraisal alone was $4,000. And the appraisal came back and said, even and it gave them a really big upcharge for the canopy on the trees mm -hmm. so you know they were working the appraiser over pretty good but and i don't think the appraiser knew we were going to put trees back in don's sitting there shaking his head he does our stormwater work with me so i don't think the appraisal knew that we were going to put all new trees back in so that the canopy would be would be repaired so even given that it was still only four thousand on the appraisal we we really bent over backwards for this homeowner 
there's 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 no clear line of sight to resolution. I got a a uh, email uh, message from one of the property owners that's affected by the flooding. He was he had come to the building to pay his taxes and he was going to stop up, but he just wanted to he didn't he wanted to vent his anger that we had promised him over two years ago that we would resolve his flooding problem, and to date we've done absolutely nothing. And I wrote him back an email saying, I appreciate your frustration, but contrary to what you think, we have never stopped working on this. We've continued to work on this. It's been an ongoing painful process uh, that we have seemingly talk about multiple times a month. Uh, so they have pushed us to the very end. We need to go in for an intimate domain proceeding. There's going to be no other outcome other than a court action on this. And then once, I will warn you, even if we, we prevail in this and we get the work done, they'll probably sue us because we knocked over a rose bush or dented their driveway or something else. They're litigious, it's gonna happen. So I don't think that this will be concluded that simply. But we got people flooding up there. Do you remember the pictures? The rest of our residents right. in our county to right. take care of those issues, regardless of being stonewalled by one resident. You gotta yep. be a good neighbor. It's not hard to be a good neighbor, but for some folks, unfortunately. Well, and for those people wondering why we don't have the right to go in there and do that, the tile was put in as a as a, by a developer there was never we believe by a developer we don't really know this is an old section but there's no easement mm -hmm. for the drain tile and and so we don't have the easement authority to go there and work on that tile mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to obtain is the easement to work on the tile bill do you want to add anything to this good morning william oliver administrative assistant for the carlisle township trustees um I'm going to be real brief. We've been long this morning, but I just want to tell you that I'm amazed at the the, uh, the consistency that Mr. Cordes and this board has offered the township and in, in the help. Uh, the trustees are appreciative. I've been keeping them updated with their meetings. Unfortunately, we do have residents there that don't attend the meetings and for some reason just aren't aware. So I apologize for our residents and their frustrations still have the pictures of water four feet deep in basements all around that area. <clears throat> just uh, just really am grateful to this this gentleman, Mr. Cordes, and, and this board. Really grateful for the, the persistence and the tenacity. Eminent domain is the last course of last for the Board of Commissioners yeah. ever want to take. Yeah. But in the case of all the residents around there, one stubborn resident can't stop this at this point. And then we've made them good offers over the years. I mean, Lori and I have been here since the beginning of this process here, Matt included now, and to just <coughs> spend these dollars. Commissioner, I've never been able to actually, with, with, with the help, and, and it's, thank you for your, your kind words, Bill, but Jerry, Don, the engineer's office, <coughs> um, it was all of us. Uh, we've never been able to work, not work out a solution. Right. To, to something. This is this is new for us. <laughs> completely new because they just became completely unreasonable. And and we offered a considerable amount of compensation, not to mention the compassion for dealing with mm -hmm. one's neighbors and, and, and thing you know, the, the things that come along with that. Uh, I'm sorry that we're presenting it to you this way. I consider this a failure, but we don't have any other options. Well this as my colleague pointed out, this is an action of last resort. You know, but I, I've said many times as an elected official, it's important that you be a good neighbor. It's, it's not fair to your neighbors if you're causing uh, uh, very unpleasant conditions for them and their homes and their properties uh, by not being a good neighbor. So, you know, this is an action of last resort. No one ever really wants to go down this road in government, but uh, sometimes your hands are tied. Clearly, we've demonstrated uh, extensive efforts to try to resolve the matter. and. Uh, resolve it in a, a logical and reasonable and fair manner and uh, unfortunately sometimes uh, fairness doesn't dominate the, the day with all parties and uh, so we are left with uh, no other choice. Well you, you certainly have exhausted many efforts and I appreciate the effort and the trustees do as well. Thanks. Nice bill. Thanks. You need a resolution now? Yeah, well, and just uh, two of the comments. One, we did look at an alternative possibility um, um, involving some area in the road right away, but 
the engineers indicate that that would just be a very temporary fix and we'd be right back at it in a few years so uh, and there is one issue with this resolution as I read it you need to um, in our negotiations as I said we we had said we would we would remove the trees from the other landowners in order to do that we need an easement over the, their property to be able to access the trees I'm including that in that even though that really isn't a necessity so I just want you to understand that's because it is included in our appraisal so I just want you to understand I'm adding that into this resolution it may be that we won't be able to prove that that's a necessity because we're only doing it at the request of these landowners and and let me make it clear the adjacent property owner has been more than cooperative right uh, so you know they they understand the situation and, and they've worked <coughs> with us from the start so that even though they're included they have not been a problem in this process okay so then I'll read this okay whereas the Board of Commissioners of Lorraine County meeting in regular session on this day find and declare the following one repeated flooding conditions that have occurred along Grafton Road and Carlisle Township causing flooding of basements and other damages to homes and landowners along the road creating a public exigency to relief from the flooding um, is being impeded by a damaged and blocked storm pipe tile along the southern border of the property located at 1644 Grafton Road permanent parcel number 10 zero 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 four one three one oh two six owned by Nancy and Wilbert J Plas. Uh, re three remedial measures to an outlet along the road will only provide a temporary fix removal of the existing uh, sewer pipe tile and installation of a new sewer pipe or tile along with bedding backfill and grading upon the premises is necessary to achieve a lasting remedy Four, the board has made repeated efforts to obtain a storm sewer easement from the owners without fruition. Five, the board deems it necessary to achieve the public purpose of relieving flooding in the area of Grafton Road and Carlisle Township to obtain a temporary and permanent easements over the premises for installation and maintenance of a storm sewer improvement. Six, board has been requested by owners to remove trees on adjacent premises the board will need an additional temporary easement upon premises to uh, accommodate the owner's wishes. Seven, the, board's deem, the board deems it necessary to proceed with the appropriation of temporary and permanent easements upon the premises as attached in the exhibits. Eight, the board hereby authorizes the Office of the Prosecuting Attorney to proceed with appropriation pursuant to Chapter 163 of the Revised Code. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Mr. Monday? Aye. Mr. Caleb? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner's report. Hmm. Yeah, we're there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, last Wednesday after our meeting, um, I spent some time with the steelworkers retirees over at Local 1104 on Broadway. I've actually been going there uh, ever since I was a little girl. My dad was a, a staff representative for the steelworkers, so um, it's kind of like going home. Um, after that, I came back to the office and I was on a conference call. I, you came in on that conference call too, didn't I hear you? Yep. Um, the CCAO, County Commissioners Association had. Uh, lasted about an hour. Uh, some of the topics were the motor vehicle gas tax, indigent attorney fee reimbursement, with, which Mr. Kalo has been working on for quite some time. And I brought up the $2 billion rainy day fund that the state is sitting on. And like Emmy said earlier, we have uh, young people dying every day, maybe two a day uh, in Lorain County and in Ohio. And I mentioned, you know, if we had a, a, a intersection here somewhere that two people who are dying a day, how much money would they throw at that intersection to alleviate that? So the state is sitting on $2 billion. They need to do something. We need help here in Lorain County and, and throughout the state. Um, that evening, I went to the Mexican Mutual. They had a, uh, a dinner there, and it was really good. A lot of fun, a lot of good people hung out with there on Wednesday evening. Uh, Thursday, I attended an event that the Ohio Democratic Party put on at Wooden Wine. They had great food. Um, they had a nice time there with you. Stayed a little bit later mm -hmm. than I probably should have. Uh, <laughs> Friday, I attended the raising of the P 
POW MIA flag, and that's where I uh, came in contact with Patricia and Ron, who did the presentation of the wall uh, this morning. Um, they asked me to say a few words during the ceremony. It was, it was very nice, and then we actually went out to breakfast afterwards and uh, had a nice conversation uh, and talked about veterans' issues. That was, oh, and then Friday, went down to Apple Festival, downtown Elyria, and stayed till evening, and it got very crowded, a lot of people down on Friday, uh, Friday during the day and in the evening, uh, met a lot of nice people. And then Saturday, the Firefish Festival, which, man, it just poured down rain all day, all night, but um, actually a lot of people still showed up and came. I realized, you know, if you have things going on, Lorraine or Elyria, people will show up and they want to, you know, attend events and, and have fun. So uh, we had a nice time down there. Sunday, I had a golf outing for the American Legion, uh, post the 118 in Amherst at Willow Golf Course. And I hadn't uh, golfed all year. It was my first time out and it was a two-man scramble, but we had a great time. I actually golfed pretty good for not being out all year. I've been so busy campaigning. So. Um, just want to say hello to everybody that was out at the golf outing. We had a we had a really nice time. So, uh, end of my report. Yeah, busy week on getting metropolitan affairs and dealing with the issues with the state legislature and planning what the large counties' issues are going to be, especially with a, I'm sure right after this election, a new governor's state office race will take off. So, also yet yeah, uh, nice event. Uh, Ohio Democrat Party had. The Blue Cocktail Hour at Wooden Wine, always great hosts out there. Again, Sherry Glass, Pam Carter's fundraiser, Mitch Phelous's fundraiser, all of those. Uh, County Commissioners Association Wednesday was a conference call. I was in Columbus on Wednesday for our monthly board meeting. Again, going over all the legislative packets that the CCAO is going to put forward. Uh, things going into the lame duck session. I spent a lot of time with Judy Nedwick. She was down there the last two days, talked about some of the issues they're looking towards lame duck hopefully moving forward again fantastic job by firefish again get wet get dry get wet get dry get wet when i was escaping i thought and the rains came down but i was way up by Dwayne building parked at the end of black river landing didn't quite make it no, wait a minute i think you called me certain really non-responsive and respectful terms because i was standing under my umbrella that was small yes enough to well, bring one. well it wasn't right you can't hold something to eat or drink with holding an umbrella gym it just doesn't work let me teach you how <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again congratulations them i spoke with paul bieber and it took a lot of diesel fuel to get the fire fish to light that night oh. uh, you stayed no, i didn't stay i talked to him the day after when i saw him at uh Bayless's or one of the other events i was at but it, it was a fabulous uh, event to showcase the arts uh bring out a lot of volunteer talent they, they don't operate on a big budget out there. Uh, the commissioners, the Port Authority, and Visit Marine County were, were sponsors. Uh, and uh, a lot of a lot of nice folks were out. But well, when that rain came down about 8 o'clock, I think it really started coming hard. That's the last one that caught me as I was going back to my car. Yeah, it just, it, I didn't think they were going to be able to burn the fish, quite frankly. So I, I think a lot of us de the departed. We did stick it out for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, I got there a little bit after 4 and walked. Broadway and then all of Black River Landing and then through and then it was a great event like I said and those are I think where the dollars that visit Lorraine County or Port Authority are going to make a difference moving forward on events that bring other people in and they're alternative events versus the normal festivals uh, it brought Broadway to life brought the Black River Landing to life again I wish I was there for the lighting but I did see it on Facebook I got for Facebook well, that's, how I, knew they, that's Facebook. how I knew they lit it I, I saw the, the picture on Facebook uh, but it, it must have been awful wet out there on the landing uh, oh, waiting sure. for them to light the fish uh also again uh uh the presentation of the gold medals to the puerto rican segregated troops uh i happen to know two of the gentlemen mr montez and mr berlin jerry very long time they're great Old gentlemen friends. great guys oh. uh <laughs> they've done just a great job on actually when they were showing the rolling thunder with the presentation there uh Mr. Berlingeri's son, Phil, who lives in actually Chicago, has a charter group of the Rolling Thunder. A dozen from chapters around the state came and actually did the escort of the uh, <coughs> veterans there. Uh, but again, Antonio Barrios, Lorraine Historical Society, great event. The first time that gold medal has been out of the Smithsonian. It was in Lorraine, Ohio. 
Uh, just an honor to be there, and they spoke so well about it. Uh, also, County Commissioners Association, I serve on a committee there that's the joint commission between the CCAO and the Board of Elections officials in discussion on voting machines, voting habits, what's going forward, some discussions we will carry on next month. Uh, but now it's a 27-day early voting because we lose a day for a holiday. There are no current court actions that were brought up at our meeting from anyone, so we will see what happened in the next two weeks prior to the early voting. That's the end of my report. As the president says, don't complain, don't boo, just vote. Right. <laughs> Get out there and vote. So, and uh, you know, again, our prayers go out to uh, the family of uh, Trooper Ken Velez, and uh, it's a tragic loss um, for for all in the area. Yep. Um, I know you were close friends with him as well, too. Oh, and pretty good friends. My wife knew him forever. Kenny was a great guy. We were just out two, three weeks ago for his birthday and stuff. So it's just a shame to see it happen. Great yeah. kids. Uh, just really good people entrenched in the city of Lorraine and it's going to be a sad event tonight and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Just remind you how important life is and you never know which day is your last day. But um, So our prayers go out to the, to the family. I um, want to congratulate uh, the Urban League on a successful luncheon they held last Friday. Also uh, uh, two community events that were held by uh, Councilwoman Pam Carter and Councilman Mitch Vallis over there in Lorraine, uh, doing a good job of uh, public service for the community over there that can certainly relate to our uh, financial struggles here because uh, Lorraine's going through a lot of the, the same things. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, MC, came out of retirement. Last time I did the uh, hosted that pageant and MC that pageant I was told was 1994. So, um, and want to congratulate all the eight uh, ladies who competed in that uh, competition. Linda Brown, who's been putting that on forever. It was the 36th year for that. Uh, Emmy uh, Wysocki was crowned the uh, Elyria Apple Festival Queen, and I managed to announce all the winners in the correct order, even though I got some coaching from Steve Harvey on how to do it. <laughs> um, but uh, it worked out really well, and it was a nice event. The only the second time in 36 years they had to move it indoors because of the, uh, the weather conditions, which unfortunately um, caught up to the firefish folks later in the day, but also want to commend the, everybody involved to organizing firefish. There's just so much energy and enthusiasm and passion around the arts in the county, and we're doing all that we can uh, uh, to help move that forward. Uh, Joanne Eldridge, her uh, retirement reception was held at the library there on Saturday, had the opportunity to go by and present her with a commendation. She's originally from Indiana, but she was serving in a, a library system in California before she came to Ohio. So I was asking her after she returned to Ohio after being in California after that first winter if she wanted to go back to California. But she said, obviously, uh, she very much fell in love with the area and served uh, the library system for a long time. The opportunity to attend the uh, NAACP dinner and thanks to uh, President Gene Rice for another uh, successful dinner there in Lorraine and the Congressional Medal um, presentation uh, Monday was just, wow, what a great moment to be a part of that history. And all three of those gentlemen, I think, are in their 90s now or late 80s. Uh, Mr. Berlin Jerry is, I believe, 83 or 84. I think okay. he was the youngest of the three. Right. Uh, but but all three of those uh, uh, gentlemen were just uh, they were hilarious when, once they got up there and had a chance to speak to the audience and just just down to earth and you know just remind you of all the people in this country who stepped forward and served this country and they were literally in a segregated army at the time and uh, couldn't even vote couldn't even vote for the president so but here they were serving our country. There is a. I don't I think at last <coughs> look there was no more World War One vets uh, still alive, and we're losing our World War Two vets mm -hmm. at an alarming rate. Um, uh, so uh, those were a different breed and caliper of folks. Well, these uh, are were Korea. I know, Korean but I'm just saying that uh, um, it's really important right now to uh, to pay our respects because. Within a few years, there will be no more WW2 vets alive to thank. And that uh, that completes my report. Board of correspondence. 
I move that we approve the uh, board correspondence and waive the reading. Second. Discussion? Mr. Lundy? Aye. Mr. Kayla? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Public comment? Anyone wishing to participate in public comment this morning? Uh, seeing no one, I would move that we go into executive session, discuss the issues outlined by the county administrator and um, also the issues, legal issues outlined by the assistant prosecutor. Second. Mr. Lundy? Aye. Mr. Kayla? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. <laughs> this has been a broadcast of the recent Lorraine County Commissioner's General Meeting. Unless otherwise announced, meetings are held Wednesday morning at 9.30 at the Administration Building, 226 Middle Avenue, 4th Floor, Downtown Elyria. These are public meetings and you are invited to attend. Agendas are posted prior to the meeting at www.lorraincounty.us. Click on Departments to see the Commissioner's page. Then click on View Agenda for a printable copy of the agenda.